do not go to hell. Ladies and gentlemen, hell is real. You do not want to go to hell. It is not a place where people are having a party. It is not a place where people are enjoying themselves. Hell is real. There's only one way to escape going to hell. It is written in the Bible. You believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and make him the Lord of your life. Hell is for real. I can't sit here and give you a lot of different fancy sounding words, but the real truth is this. Do not go to hell. Do not go to hell. If you ever wondered how to escape the fires of hell, pray this prayer with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I am sorry for my sins. Come into my life and become the Lord of my life. I believe that you died on the cross over 2,000 years ago to pay for the, my sins and I make you the Lord and Savior of my life. Let your Holy Spirit help me live a righteous life before you. In Jesus name.
says that the Holy Spirit weeps for us. That is God weeping because we sin. And if sinners don't want to give up sin, He will eliminate them. If you have embraced sin, believing erroneously today that there'll be no judgment for it, flee that as quickly as you can. Walk in what is right. God is no grandfather. He's not one who just ignores anything you do like grandfathers do. Now the question arises, what is God telling you to stay away from? Jesus does not want you going there. He does not want you to go there. It was prepared for the devil. It was not prepared for mankind. If we keep continuing in sin and we do not obey Jesus, um, hell is waiting for us to meet us when we, when we die. So when we begin an argument with, well, I wouldn't believe in a God who would, who would what? Do something that you wouldn't do? Or think in a way that's different from the way you think? Do you ever even consider the possibility that maybe the Creator's sense of justice is actually more developed than yours and that maybe his love and his mercy are perfect and that you could be the one that is flawed a lot of things in this book that i go wow god you did that you thought that i wouldn't think that and i wouldn't have done that but when i come to those passages and when you come to those passages does it even enter your mind that maybe he knows something that you don't? Uh, all of the grieving that goes on when a loved one leaves you, that's how God grieves for your love because he says, I'm doing everything for you. I'm giving you life. I'm giving you breath. You're breathing only because I say so. You're only still here because I say so. You're only still here because I love you and you don't love me and you don't love me and you don't care about me and you sin, you don't ask me for help, you don't ask me for release from what troubles you. God is wonderful, loving, just, and kind, but you cannot mock Him. You cannot play games with the Holy God. Do you want more out of this life, or do you want more out of God? And he said in Proverbs 14, 12, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We don't see judgment falling quickly. We think it's just not going to happen. It doesn't seem real to us. All the more reason should we shake and tremble. Daniel, if the book of your life was to be closed today, this would be your portion. No. I'm a pastor. I'm a child of God. I'm born again. I preached all over this, this country. I mean, the, the country in which I'm... This, this can't be. No. Daniel, on your way to the first hospital, you were asking God to forgive you, but you would not forgive your wife, and your sins have not been forgiven. It is a matter of reaping what you've sown. You cannot sow unforgiveness to your wife and reap forgiveness from God. And immediately he made that statement. My spirit convinced me that what the angel told me or the judgment on me is true. I didn't say no, because I remembered. I was only saying, you see how I destroy my soul? Look at how I destroy my soul. While I was shouting and crying, I was afraid. Tears was all over me. I was panicking because that place is not good for anybody. I think one of the most horrible things that I saw, pastors, mm -hmm. was 
when I saw this group of uh, men burning in skeleton forms, mm -hmm. they were skinless mm -hmm. and they were screaming and holding make-believe books mm -hmm. like Bibles that were burning, but they were transparent mm -hmm. and with the shape of a book mm -hmm. and they were preaching the gospel in hell. And they were screaming and screaming, and I kept thinking of that. Even after the Lord brought me out, how I must stay holy before God. He's a living God and a seeing and a knowing God. And we can't get away with our little gitchy goo and cutting corners as if he does not observe it. So the reason your husband is here, because he had unforgiveness in his heart. If you have unforgiveness mm -hmm. in your heart, mm -hmm. you've got to get that out because you can't go to heaven. And this is so... God loves you guys. He does not want you to go into this place because it is forever forever and forever God came to get us off that road stop living in sin get away from it you get separated from God when you do that and there is no protection for the person who willfully embraces wrong but God will forgive murderers mm -hmm. God will forgive any sin but we got to be faithful and just and come to him and say Lord I'm the murderer I'm the thief I'm the robber forgive me God I'm the liar it's to let them know God expects us to turn to him and turn from our sins with a, you know with truth and righteousness and let him clean up our lives yes, sure. and he will help us pastor mm -hmm. he will help us overcome everything We've got this one window of opportunity Satan has come to kill steal and destroy that's where the evil comes from on the earth, not from God. He's the giver of life. And I was going to say another horrible sight I seen was people that when the Holy Ghost would pull them in a service and the pastor would give an altar call mm -hmm. and it was like a, a flashback I could see when the Lord would deal with their little hearts and they kept thinking the devil would say, well, you not go in the world for a while. You got a few more time. The devil would whisper in their ear. He said, you don't go down that altar. They'll laugh at you, make fun of you. And the young people would put it off or the older people, they think, well, maybe tomorrow. And then eventually the trap was set and they'd be killed instantly and cut off suddenly without remedy and they'd go straight to him. was manifested so we wouldn't go to him. I'd rather you get mad at me and go to heaven. I remember just rising up out of my body. Dying was just uh, very painless. By the time uh, I got there, it, I was virtually dead. I almost bled to death. The angels took Daniel by his shoulders and lifted him out of the ambulance. And suddenly I was pulled out of my body, and I found myself falling through the air, and I landed in a prison cell in hell. I, I was caught up in a real... Uh, massive, swirling, funnel-shaped cloud. Some group of people, thousands of people, we have been sent into hell. This force or whatever that was sucking them back down in the pit, they kept getting sucked back down, these people. They, uh, they tried to crawl 
So I beg you, I beg you, I beg you because you're going to go to an eternal hell forever and ever and ever. And I don't want you to do that. 15, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Look. All through the Bible, when there was a great move of God, great things were told to people by angels, right? Yes. And God is doing that thing today. <clears throat> he is bringing forth messages mm -hmm. from the throne of God to this, to this earth. If most of us go on a vacation, we check out the sites, the hotels, the restaurants, we do some investigation. But yet most people do no investigation on where they're gonna go after they die. He got up with a broken 16 ounce glass bottle and started stabbing me. By the time I got there, I was virtually dead. I almost bled to death. The ambulance, I thought, blew up. I mean, it, it caught on fire, and the, and the thing filled full of smoke, and I thought it was an electrical fire. My body felt like it began to just come up off the gurney and float away. I'm looking into what looked like the open mouth of a, of a volcanic crater, and I'm falling into this thing with no, just no help. Uh, how does someone enter hell? Through a gateway. There's gateways called tunnels. Right. They're kind of like tunnels or tornadoes, and they spin around and back again in the atmosphere. A group of people, thousands of people, we have been sending to hell. Yeah. Or whatever that was sucking them back down to the pit. They kept getting sucked back down, these people. They, uh, they actually descend down this gateway into hell. I was feeling like really guilty, feeling like, how can I call myself a Christian? I'm still living in sin. I was living as a hypocrite. I was doing whatever I wanted, and I uh, never repented. So God showed me a warning that hell is real. And then when that happened, this portal just came right up here, a huge one. And then what happened was, is it was just this portal of fire swirling around or whatever and people were immediately just screaming trying to get out of it and I just saw it was terrifying. The moment I heard him screaming and I heard that pastor is dead, I knew he's my husband. <laughs> the angels took Daniel by his shoulders and lifted him out of the ambulance. For me to look up, I saw two angels. So he, after checking everything, he now confirmed that I was totally dead. He now gave them certificate that I sh they should remove me. You can see it here, say, uh, uh, remove for mortuary. Daniel, if the book of your life was to be closed today, this would be your portion. No. And suddenly I was pulled out of my body and I found myself falling through the air and I landed in a prison cell in hell. And this prison cell was filthy, stinky. And the stench is awful. And the, the smells in hell are so foul and putrid and disgusting, worse than anything you can ever imagine. Like uh, the worst open sewer, bad eggs, rotten milk, everything, again, times a thousand. What were you able to smell? The smell of stench, of sewers, smell of burning, rotten flesh. Dirty, smoke filled. So full of smoke, I can't breathe. I'll demonstrate to you, this is how you breathe in hell. It was like. <clears throat> <clears throat> and that's as much air as you could get. The air was so thin, you could hardly breathe. Well, you, you don't have enough air to breathe in hell. You have to fight and gasp for even the tiniest bit of air. Rough hewn stone walls and bars. Isaiah 24, 22 says, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. And this is where I could first see people. I, could, I was listening to the screams all this time. It is so loud and deafening in hell. The awful part is the cries of the dead. 
uh, the moans and the groans of the regret because they missed Jesus. Because in whatever condition we end this life or in the Lord's coming, in that condition we eternally remain. There is no remedy. There's a finality. When I saw these people or whatever, they were trying to reach out out of this pit to me, screaming. Daniel could hear the crying and wailing of many people. They were in different nations, okay? Different languages, but... They were from every race, culture, and nationality. It's me over next to this pit of fire. This raging pit of fire that was about a mile across. Enormous pit with flames raging high up into this open cavern. And it was brimstone falling and uh, like lava falling from, from above. And there was a place where people, souls that just died on earth came and they were thrown into liquid boiling fire mixed with uh, hot lava. And this was the judgment of God upon the abominals. There were people literally inside this pit, in the flames burning. And seek death and shall not find it. They shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. Psalms 140 verse 10 says, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. But in hell, there was huge thousands and thousands of, of people burning in miles and miles. I could see 50 miles back, mm. as close as here, mm. of souls burning that was adulteresses and fornicators mm -hmm. and liars in the compartments in different areas all in here. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. I saw people that died of drug overdoses and died drunk. Well, their, their bones were charred red, and they would scream and scream, saying, no man cares for my soul. But it, yeah, it was like rotting flesh, but it was... Dad, I began to see people in this fire burning, but, but they're not burning up. They were being tortured. I'm a pastor. I stole money from the church, and I lied. Help me, please. I'm ready to repay! Will you remind them that people pray in hell but nobody ever answers? Screaming at me and calling my name and telling me to go back, to not come there. There's no escape. There's no way out. And they would say, warn, warn the people not to come here. And most of the people in hell would scream that. Tell my family not to come to hell. Tell them to accept the Messiah as their Savior. That's what they would say. Be asking me, please, help, help. So all I could remember is them saying, help, help, help me. And they were just reaching out. The sister and chapter will be blown to smithereens. That the soul of a man will live forever and ever and ever and ever. God did not originally intend for anybody to go to hell. He originally created hell for Lucifer and his angels. They rebelled against him because they wanted free will and they also saw how, as the atheists say, he would become a monstrous tyrant. So Yahweh cast him down into this earth for in the future for them to be sent to hell, for all eternity to burn, forever. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, that permanently made them go to hell, as well as every single human born onto this earth. We are all destined to go to hell. But we have free will. If we reject Jesus and we reject the true word of God, he will send us there forever. Because we have freedom of choice. We either choose to go to hell or we choose to go to heaven. You choose to disobey, you choose to rebel, you choose to disobey God, you will burn forever. And us Jesus followers will be in bliss for all eternity because we love Jesus and we are afraid of going to hell. Now there are people who claim that hell is not a literal place. It's just a separation of God. Or when you die and you go to hell, you're just annihilated. That's not true. Hell is a literal place for fire and brimstone where your flesh will burn and you will gnaw your teeth and you will be wishing for a single ounce of water to be touching your tongue and you will never get any. Hell is a real place and you will burn forever if you do not accept Jesus Christ. Ignore all those non-believers who claim that hell was originally created for us just because God is omniscient and he knew everything that was going to happen before he even created the universe. Which means, according to them, we would go to hell because we are born this way and he knew that and he will send us there anyway. That's what they claim anyway. Ignore them when they say that we have no true fear well, of an omniscient being who created the universe because he knows all. He knows every single action you and I would do. Ignore that because we have free will. We have the freedom to go to heaven and we have the freedom to go to hell. We choose to go to heaven and hell. Ignore those ignorant, arrogant atheists. They tell lies and nothing else. They know nothing about the Bible and they know nothing about the Word of God. They are ignorant and they lack logic.
Christians that wound up in hell by Caramello Brenes. In 1982, I had an accident in which I died. As death came over me, I felt everything become dark, and I found myself walking through a dark tunnel, and there was some kind of being that was taking me. While we walked in this cold and dark tunnel, I began to hear horrific screams and moans, and an intense fear was growing inside of me. I knew that, although my body was already dead, I was somehow still alive in this place. I saw large snakes moving all around, and all the people there were crying out for water. Soon we arrived at an open plateau, and there were many chambers and divisions that I saw, and each contained different people inside. I began to cry out with terror, begging God for mercy. Lord, remember my life! Have mercy! Sheer terror was gripping my soul, and my whole life was passing before my eyes. As we approached some door, I shouted again, Have mercy on me, Lord! Have mercy on me! I beg you to help me! Help me, Lord! Suddenly, there was a silence, and I heard a voice say, Stop! The voice shook all of hell. And that thing that was taking me by the hand released me. I am not the god of adulterers. I am not the god of fornicators. I am not the god of liars. Why do you call me Lord if I'm not the god of those who boast? I felt like I was going to be destroyed. But as the moments passed, God's voice became softer. Come, and I will show you the things going on in this place that are waiting for all those who haven't been willing to follow my ways and have walked after the imaginations of their own hearts. We then went to a place where I saw a woman sitting on a rocking chair. There were still terrifying moans and screams coming from all over that place. Now at first, she seemed okay, but then her body transformed into a witch, and she screamed in agony, burning in flames. She begged for mercy, but the Lord said to me, The wages of sin is death, and those who arrive in this place will never get out again. The Lord showed me many disobedient people, many who were once part of a Christian church, and they were crying out and begging for mercy. But there was no mercy. Mercy could only be found while a person is still alive on earth. Once people are dead, mercy cannot be reached anymore. As it says, it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews 9.27 Jesus also showed me a place with some kind of boiling oil, and there were people suffering inside, burning in the flames and trying to get out. But demons would throw them back in. We walked until we came to a place with people that had once listened to the Word of God, but never wanted to repent. I even saw pastors, evangelists, believers, and missionaries and they were all there for different reasons. I saw one pastor who never believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, healing, or the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he was begging for mercy and just one more chance to tell the world that tongues were real, that the Holy Ghost is real, and that there's real freedom in the gospel. But it was too late for him. He could never get out. Even though he was once a pastor, his chance to repent was only possible on earth. I also saw a missionary in hell, and he was there because he asked for money to open a mission in Africa. But he kept half the money for himself. 
And now he just begs for mercy and another chance to return the money that wasn't his. When he saw that Jesus could not help him, he cursed Jesus. I saw people there that were once inside a church praising God. Now they only cry out for mercy for their unrepented sins. They lost their chance to repent after they died. I saw pastors there who robbed tithes and offerings from their churches. They also begged to undo all their bad works. But there was no more chance to repent. Those who die without Jesus Christ go to hell. And those who die with Jesus Christ go to heaven. And many people believe that dying is just the stopping of existence, which is called annihilationism. But after death, your real life begins, either in God's glory or in everlasting condemnation and shame. You are making that choice right now. And we must all carefully meditate on where we will spend eternity. Do you want to spend eternity in hell or in God's glory? It's your choice. We continued walking to another horrifying place where there were demons of all types, different shapes and forms and sizes. Some of them had just one arm and eye and one leg, and their faces were like half of a human, uh, but the rest was just empty. And I asked the Lord, Lord, what is this? And Jesus said, These are demons of destruction in the homes of all those who are lost. This is the demon that will destroy and destroy without rest day after day. The torment in that place is so terrible. The souls always remember the things they did while on earth, just like in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man could remember that he had a father and five brothers. You remember all the things you did in your life, good or bad. You remember all your relatives. And this is part of the torment because you so desperately don't want them to enter hell also. Today, there are many people that preach the gospel, warning those on earth to repent. The only one who can save you is Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father, ready to save you. As it is written, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12 Trust in Jesus alone. I even saw children in hell. I witnessed a woman with two children who were yelling at their mother. Why? Why didn't you take us to Sunday school? Why didn't you allow us to go to church? They cursed her because she never allowed them to hear the gospel. Even today, I still feel the pain in my soul when I remember that there are even young children in hell. I saw some between the ages of 12 and 14 years old, and they also regret many of the things they did while on earth. And many Christians ignorantly say that children can never be lost because they're so young. But I tell you, if a child can distinguish between good and evil, and they are not walking in the ways of the Lord, they can also arrive in that place of torment. In the Bible, it says, I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to the what they had done, as recorded in the books. Revelations 20:12. All persons that can comprehend between good and evil will have to stand before the Lord, and nothing is hidden from the eyes of the Lord. We continued walking until we came to a place that was similar to some type of stadium, and there were demons all around, and they were laughing at the lost souls. They were mocking them and tormenting those who were made in God's image. 
the demons would tear off parts of the people and hide them, making the people search all around for it. Demons were getting sadistic pleasure by inflicting pain. As it is written, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. John 10.10 10. The people there desperately thirst for water, but there is none. They regret even the day that they were born. But the worst feeling is for those who knew Jesus, but then walked away from him. If you walked away from Jesus and are no longer following his ways, today is the day to come back. Don't be ashamed of what your friends or anyone else may say. Remember what Jesus said about those who are ashamed of him. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Luke 9, 26 It is time for you to run to the presence of God and to look for salvation. Don't look for a church that makes you feel good. Look for a church where the Spirit of the Lord moves and repent of all your sins. It is time for deep repentance. Time to cry out to the Lord and run to Jesus. If you have sins that you have not stopped, your soul is in danger because the Bible says that Jesus will come as a thief in the night. Are you ready or not? Sadly, we continued watching the demons torment the people. I saw one demon rip out a person's eye and hide it, and that person had to drag himself in pain to find it. The demons were getting pleasure from their cruelty. To some, they ripped off arms and legs. But to those who had once known the Lord, but died in their sins, their punishment was much worse. They had a double condemnation. Those who never knew God were also in torment. But there is more suffering for those who knew Jesus and then became backsliders. While I was there, I felt unspeakable terror and sheer panic in my soul. I had such compassion for all the souls that were crying out for mercy. And Jesus said, I will show you how many things are still waiting for lost souls. We passed another place that had many different burning cells. And inside the cells were souls. But all that was left of them was just charred gray bones. But they could still feel pain. And they screamed out for mercy from Jesus as he walked by. I found out that these people were once in churches. Some even preached the word of God during their lifetime. Some cast out demons and spoke in tongues while on earth. But now, these Christians were down here because one day, they decided to turn away from the ways of God. I even saw the road to hell. The Lord said, Look at this wide street. And I saw a street where a multitude of believers were walking and they were even carrying Bibles. I saw some praying, and others were singing praises. And I saw how the narrow road of God branched off to the right. But the Christians continued walking straight to hell. Jesus explained, They have a double life. They are living two lives, one in my house of prayer, and the other in their own houses. I said, But Lord, these people are praising your name. Jesus replied, Yes, and even when they cry, shout, and say nice things about me or to me, their hearts are full of adultery, full of evil, full of lies, full of deception, full of hate, full of roots of bitterness, full of bad thoughts. 
And then I understood what scripture meant when it said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 7.21 Many Christians have some hatred or bitterness in their heart towards their brothers, and many even skip church because of that brother. But when the pastor asks the church, How many of you love the Lord? They say, Amen! But the Bible says that those who hate their brothers are like murderers, and no murderer can come into the kingdom of heaven. Just as it is written, anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, You fool! will be in danger of the fire of hell. Matthew 5.22 These brothers will deeply regret that when the Lord returns. The Bible tells us, Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in his guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people. But love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19.17 It's so sad when those who serve the Lord don't make it into heaven. You need to seriously meditate on this and ask, Am I ready for the Lord? Am I really doing the will of God? Is my life pleasing to God? You still have time to turn your heart to God and escape hell. Some people don't care about where they're going. They only want to enjoy this life. But I tell you, spending time with Jesus, not some woman, that's enjoying life. Spending time in the Lord's house, not a bar, that's life. We need to ask God for mercy for those who are still walking on the road of death and sin. In hell, we saw many who thought they were living holy while on earth, but now they were just begging for mercy and another chance. My soul aches so much for them. We saw a woman who was acting like she was reading from the Bible, and she preached about John 3.16. She said, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus said she was there because she could never forgive her husband. She never managed to forgive her husband. This woman had been shepherding an evangelical church for 35 years. But now, in hell, she's begging for one more chance to forgive her husband. The Bible warns us, settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Matthew 5, 25 And Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Matthew 5, 7 If you are someone who cries in the presence of the Lord, you are still under grace and mercy. But if you feel you cannot cry anymore, or pray anymore, if you have stopped your prayer life, you are in great danger. Forgiveness is something special, and that woman never forgave. After 35 years of hard work for God, she lost it all in the end. Meditate on this and make sure you forgive all. How do you want to spend eternity? My brother would often tell me, The day I die, I'll go to hell and I'll let the demons torment me. But thankfully, he has repented of this foolish belief. 
because the judgment of God has reached him. While recording this message, he is currently lying down, sick with AIDS. He begged God for a chance, and he has finally turned his heart to Jesus. He does not think the same way anymore, and he doesn't want to go to that place of torment. Thankfully, my brother has accepted Jesus as his Savior. But my brother was lucky. He knew he didn't have much time left. But most people don't know when they will die. Jesus and I continued walking until we came upon a group of people who called themselves Evangelical Christians. Jesus explained to me why they were in hell. In the neighborhood where they lived, there was a drunk man that became a Christian. One day his wife got severely ill, and he began to go door to door, seeking help to bring her to the hospital. When he got to the house of a Christian, he told them, My wife is very sick. I need you to lend me some money to take her to the hospital. But the Christian told him, Ah, that is what you say. No, we don't have any money here. When he went to another Christian's house, they also refused to help him. Eventually, the man's wife died. One of the Christians said, I sure taught that drunk a lesson. He just wanted money to get drunk. But he didn't fool me. I didn't give him a single penny. Now, in hell, they are in fire and torment, and deeply regret their evil. These men were tied up with ropes and burning. Their skin was falling from their bodies, and there was no end to the torment. They remember all the evil that they had done. A proud Christian. Please listen to me carefully. I was also an evangelical Christian. I prayed for the sick, and God healed them. I prayed for the lame, and God raised them up. I cast out demons and spoke in new tongues. But I had a spirit of vain glory that made me see my pastor as spiritually smaller than me. I saw many miracles in my ministry, more than my pastor. But I began to think that it was me that I was the one doing the miracles. In my vain glory, I thought that I was super gifted, someone special. I didn't understand that it was the mercy of God that was in my life. When I got to hell, God told me, I am not the God of people with vain glory. Many of us stand before the altar of God, full of pride and vain glory. Many who sing praises to God begin to be full of pride. Many of God's servants who preach the word and are used mightily by God begin to think that they are overly important. Many people who work in deliverance also get full of pride. I want to tell you that God sees all and he knows your heart. If you have vainglory, pride, or arrogance in your heart. If you see your brother or pastor with disdain, please repent of your sins quickly. It is much better to be humiliated before men than be humiliated in the presence of the Lord. I wish you could see this place like I did. I wish you could hear the cries of the damned, feel the terror that I did, and see their final judgment. Then you'd understand. We continued walking until we arrived at some kind of waiting room. We saw a demon that was shouting, and other demons were presenting themselves before him. Two of them were in the form of beautiful women. Their job was to destroy ministries and lead ministers into sin. Those who serve the Lord must be careful of Satan's traps. Satan wants to destroy your life. And he can use those people who are close to you, 
those people who do not walk close to Jesus. They can be instruments of Satan. Satan also has demons that are disguised as men. They go into churches and search for young ladies, and even married women, to lead them into sin, destroying marriages and lives. In hell, I also saw a man that blasphemed against the Holy Spirit. He was begging for mercy and shouting in pain. There were worms all over his face and body, and he tried to remove them, but more would always come. His pain was unbearable. This man was worried about his family members arriving in hell. If you truly love your family, preach the word of God to them, so that many may escape from hell. Christians need to remember that even though they can hide the truth from the pastors, deacons, elders, and the congregation, they cannot hide from the presence of the Lord, as it is written. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Psalms 139, verse 7. Lying to God. It might sound crazy, but many Christians wind up in hell because of lying. Christians often just nonchalantly lie in church and think nothing of it. The pastor may ask them a question, and a member just lies to them. But we must remember that a simple lie is what caused God to kill Ananias and Sapphira while in church, from Acts 5 verse 3. Many Christians are in hell because they simply lied to the pastor. They didn't realize that they were lying to God. And the Bible warns us, no drunks, no adulterers, no fornicators, no liars shall inherit the kingdom of God. You must know that just because you claim to be a Christian, you can still be unclean before God if you keep sinning. I was personally being used by God, but still had vain glory in my heart. There is still time to repent and renew your heart and mind. If you're a lukewarm Christian, backsliding or living a double life, bow your head right now before God and beg for forgiveness. Be willing to turn away from evil deeds. And if you don't know Jesus, Pray now and ask Him for forgiveness. Ask Him into your heart. Accept Him as your Savior. Don't waste any more time. And don't be a Christian that winds up in hell. What's up, people? Uh, I'm putting this video out there for people who are lost, who are unsure of what's happening here. You know, unsure of what lies after this this life that we have, and uh, and I know what's after here from seeing it, and it's very scary, and it's my duty since I'm still here to let you know what I seen. Um, at a point in my life I was drug addicted, I was an alcoholic, um, my usual day was go to work, I always made good money so I'd go to work, do my job, but after that, party hard. 
drinking, drugging all night. Come home early in the a.m. Sometimes don't come home for a day or two. You know, uh, go on binges with the drugs and this and that. And basically, I, it was like the Wild West. Anything went. I could do and did do whatever I wanted. I didn't care what anybody said. I had no consequences. I lived in excess and a total pagan lifestyle with not caring of anything. Now, during that time, my whole life I've loved Jesus in my heart, you know. But, you know, I, I prayed every night. I prayed with my kids, but I knew I was a hypocrite, you know. When I was home, I'd pray with them, but it was like, you know, I'd pray with them and then I'm a screw up, you know what I'm saying? So, I was hypocritical, but I knew my kids needed to know the truth, and the truth was God. I just wasn't following the truth. And I remember in my addiction every day saying, Lord, please don't take me today because I am not ready. And uh, I lived that pagan lifestyle for years. And one time I was on meth and I was up for five days. And, uh, and I mean five days up. No closing of the eyes, none of that, just a blink. You weren't sleeping, you were up. And uh, my body started to go into some kind of convulsion, no dying, whatever. I mean, my heart was jumping out of my chest, 911, ambulance, all that stuff. Uh, and I thought I was dying. And, um, you know, I said goodbye to my children, you know, because I didn't think I was going to see them again, you know, honestly. And uh, I was trying to give them, like, Lifelong lessons, as I can hear the ambulance a couple blocks away coming. Hey, guys, believe in God. Uh, don't be mad at God. Try and be like Job. You know, understand that the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. You know, trying to make all this stuff up in two seconds when nobody's listening because it's panic. You know, and uh, I thought that was the last time I was going to see my family. And uh, on that ambulance trip now to the hospital... I was out of my body three different times on the ceiling of the ambulance you know and I'm sitting there and I'm floating and I'm looking down and I see my body and I'm like oh my gosh you know what did I do you know I'm outside of my body how is this possible you know is this is this what I made of my life you know, I had everything. The Lord, I, I could see the Lord gave me kids, three beautiful children, gave me a wife. And look what I've done. I, I've ignored everything. I've thrown, I've spit in his face at every possible chance. And just did what I wanted to do. What was pleasing to me, to my flesh. So, as I'm going through that, you know, peace, craziness in my body. Peace, craziness. Now, I say peace because I was out of my body and I wasn't in the, you know, convulsions or whatever that I was in when I was in my body. When I was out of it, I was cool. I was just, you know, it was real peaceful, but I was in pitch blackness. So it was peace, but I was scared. I was like, what is this? You know what I mean? Where am I at and what's going to happen now? The transition from my body was just like me stepping over. You know what I'm saying? So I realized... I don't know where I'm at, and I was pretty scared to be in that darkness, even though it was peace. So, I remember, uh, you know, going to the emergency room, and they, you know, putting IVs and all in me, and anyway, I just said, Lord, if you want to take me tonight, then I accept your will, but if you let me live, I'll do better. And with that, I sat back, relaxed, and, you know, thank God. I stabilized and uh, and I made it, you know, maybe 10 hours later I was discharged, you know, and uh, I remember one of the guys saying to me, um, one of the ambulance guys coming in later on in the shift, he came over and he said, oh, you made it, man, and I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I was thanking him for helping me and all, and he said, you know, i seen guys come in here in less shape than you and leave with uh, a sheet over them, and he said, I didn't think... You know, I wasn't sure if you were going to make it. And I thought to myself, man, you know, I came that close to death. And, uh, but by the grace of God, I returned home that night. Or early the next morning. And, uh, from that point on, 
I sought out detox and all that and within a couple of days I was in a detox and trying to do my thing and get sober so when I get done with that stuff that program uh, I come home I you know feel myself out get used to myself a little bit and I go back to work now when I go back to work first day I'm back to work a guy's chopping out some heroin so it's like I go to step towards him you know because I see the heroin my mind's telling me go get a bump you know but it's like wait I can't do that you know I I gotta live a sober life now so for six months I tried to live sober and I did live sober I didn't drink uh, you know I was still smoking cigarettes and stuff but no weed no cigarette uh, no beer you know no alcohol no drugs so and even during that time, you know, I, I couldn't leave the job. You know, I had a prayer book with me, and I would, you know, there'd be times I just pulled a prayer book out and start praying to God or reading a page or two because I needed help. You know, I wanted to go to the bar or this or that. I couldn't drive around town because every street in that town I had partied on or done something on that would trigger me, and uh, I was worried I might fall into drinking again. So, for six months I chased God. Now. I didn't do it right because I didn't know how to get to God. I didn't know how to approach God or how to come to God. I would go to church at break time or lunch time, sit in church, pray. But you know, at the same time, I was looking into other things like the occult. I was looking into astral travel, psychics, mediums. I was looking into past lives. Um, I had even attended uh, some uh, big... Uh, hotel or something one of these famous uh, psychic mediums you know there's maybe been a hundred people there and you pay a hundred bucks and go see them and it was like I was trying with all my might to seek out the truth but I was in, you know trying to come to Christ and also bringing in the occult which you know isn't going to weigh out you can't be with Jesus if you're with the occult so I was confused and I really did not know how to seek him out now after six months of sobriety, I uh, I started to get weak and irritated, and because uh, it was so hard for me every single day to get home, you know, to get my butt in that house without pulling out of my driveway and going get something to drink, you know, it was such a tough struggle. And looking back, it was amazingly tough. Uh, but I started to get irritated and. You know, I said to my wife, six months today. She said, six months for what? And I said, six months I've been sober. She's like, oh, that's good. I thought, that's good. You know, now being an adult, I'm supposed to do stuff for myself. But at that point, I had struggled through so much every day. I want to, you know, I want a huge uh, party or something. Rain, you know, run a parade down the street or something. Let's break out a celebration. You know, this is six months, man. Every day. Some of my days feel like they're a hundred years from all this, you know. So with that, I was like, you know what? Okay, or that's good, good. You know, I'll show you good, you know. So my whole mindset changed right there. And, uh, and not that it's her fault, but, you know, I was probably looking for a reason to do that because I was already irritated so all of a sudden I go back and I go back to drinking and then I go back to drugging and what they say is true when you go back you go back harder each time and that was definitely holding true in this instance Now, now, when I went back this time, I felt like such a failure. How could I, how could I have been out of my body three times, been through all this stuff, almost died, you know? And there's countless other times in your addiction where you were in a situation you could have died. And, uh, and I'm still drinking again now, and I'm drinking hard now, harder and harder and more and more. If I woke up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, I'm drinking a beer, smoking a joint, hitting a bowl, whatever. I used to tell people I drink when my eyes are open. It wasn't a joke. I'd get a 30 pack, set it right next to me because there's no reason to put it in the fridge because I'm going to kill it before you can drink your six pack most of the time. Uh, I was insane. Now I fell into drugs and coke and whatever else I could get my hands on at this point. 
And it got me to the point where I was going to kill myself. Before I always said, I'm not going to kill myself because I love my family. Well, let me tell you something. Never say never because I got to a point where I said, I'm done. You know, I got to the point where I said, my family's better off without me because I can't even go anywhere without drinking. No matter where I go, I have to drink. Whether I'm putting it in a soda can, wherever I'm at. Driving around, you know, McDonald's cups with the straw through a beer can and a McDonald's cup looking like I'm drinking McDonald's, you know, and coffee cups, you know, beer. It's insane. So I honestly thought I'm better off dead, you know. They'll be sad for a minute, but they'll get over it because who needs a sloppy drunk dad, you know, nobody. So I came across a weapon that I was going to shoot myself with. And, uh, Put the bullets in it, locked the door in my house, sitting there with a uh, the gun in my mouth and ready to shoot myself. The only thing I was thinking is which way to aim the gun so I don't mess this up. I didn't want to mess up killing myself. You know, In my pagan life, I remember seeing Rotten.com, a guy tried to kill himself and messed it up. His whole face was gone. He had tubes going down him. I'm like, that's the last thing I need, you know. The bullet was so lovely to think about. You know, one bullet can take away all this mess and pain I'm in. You know, count me in. And that's how I felt. So I had the gun loaded in my mouth, and I'm trying to figure out, like, which way to make sure I kill myself. And something hits me. Bam! Like, you know, guardian angel, something telling me, hey, your kids are at home. You know, your wife is home. It's bad enough you're killing yourself, but, you know, don't let them hear the shot that did it. Don't let them come in and find you, you know what I mean? And I was like, ah, oh, all right, you know. And I thought, you know what, it is horrible I'm doing this, so let me just wait till tomorrow, and uh, I'll kill myself down on the beach, you know what I mean? And uh, so I unloaded and put everything away up, you know. I hit it up near the ceiling there and locked all the doors and, you know, left my room and went out there, and I watched my kids play. My wife talked to them regular, you know. Because I didn't let on that anything was wrong at all because I never showed any kind of uh, I need help kind of thing. Everybody would have been shocked. I had hid everything my whole life. So, you know, I was used to hiding stuff. And uh, it's a weird feeling to watch your kids playing and your wife and you know in your head, they have no clue I'm going to kill myself tomorrow. You know, it's a crazy, crazy feeling to have. The night went on regularly, laughed, joked, whatever. Said prayers with the kids, put them to bed. Good night to the wife. We went to bed. As I'm sleeping, all of a sudden I'm in hell. Now when I say hell, I mean I mean this cave. The cave is humongous. I can't even describe the, you know, over to my left, there's like a, a two mile wide crater with orange like yellowish, reddish flames coming up and the screams are millions at the same time. And the thought that hit my head was like, that's where Hitler's at. That's where the major people who are leading a lot of people to death are, you know, or did have or whatever, or where they will be going. And where I was, was up on this ledge and there was two like, uh, entrance like cave entrances there you know what I'm saying I didn't go into them but I could see them and uh, I had a demon there was demons all over and there was people just screaming all over and a demon would grab my right arm and pull and would rip my arm off where I would my whole arm would come off and I'd see the skin hanging and the veins and the blood and you know the first two or three times you see that you're still used to thinking how we do on Earth, and on Earth we're like, oh no, what panic. But there, it's different. So, you're shocked. But, he'd pull it off, and a couple seconds later, it would be back on again, and he would do the same thing all over again, and he'd be holding my arm, looking at me, laughing, because he just wants to see the fear, the fright, on my face. So, in front of me stood this, only way I can describe it is a monster. And I'm talking like 
four foot wide, huge shoulders. Um, like Sully off of uh, Monsters, Inc., if you ever seen that. And that was a cool movie and all, but this guy was like evil, huge, big like that, huge. Um, like knives, you know, huge claws, huge. And these things, he would, he would just go like this, wham, and come off from this side. And when he'd hit me, he'd just rip my stomach to shreds and my whole insides would fall on the ground of the cave. And I'd look down and, you know, once again, you're shocked. How's this happening? You know, can't, if it happens here, we're dead. But there, by the time he'd pull his hand back again, I was healed. And he would do it all over again, and he'd laugh at me. So the whole thing there, they wanted to laugh. They wanted to see your fear. They wanted to torture you. And they were content to do this forever. You absolutely knew that in your heart as you are there. But I remember cursing at him, saying, Do you really think I give a F what you're doing? Think about it. On this earth, I'd run crazy from this guy. But there... I, he didn't even affect me because I couldn't feel my stomach being tore open. I couldn't feel my arm being ripped off. And even with the smells and even with the screams, the panic, the chaos, constantly. The chaos for me was the separation from God, knowing that I can't, I can pray all I want. I can't get my prayers up to him. It's over, you know. It's like grabbing a rubber ball trying to throw it through the ceiling. It's not going to happen. You know, and for, I realized instantly that if, as long as you're living, as long as you're breathing and walking on this earth, I don't care if you're atheist, I don't care what you are, new age and this and that, wake up because as long as you're breathing, you have a shot to pray to Jesus, to drop to your knees, to ask God to come into your life, to save your life, and to turn your life over to God. And you can do that as long as you're breathing. Once you breathe your last breath, the dishes are done. Whatever you've accumulated to that point will be what happens. And a lot of people say, well, my God isn't a, isn't a, uh, he's a loving God, and, and there is no hell, and he wouldn't put you in hell, and he wouldn't do this and that. Let me tell you something. That's all nice and everything, and you can keep that where you keep it. But hell is real. And you know who put yourself in hell? You. Because you're shown how you lived. You see everything you've ever done. And why, as you know, as you see, you, you judge yourself. Well, I, I wasn't this good. I did this. I did that. He has a law for us to follow. And if you don't follow it, you're going to be in hell. In hell, my heart wants to just explode just thinking of that place. I wish I had a thousand years to live here to do good every day I could just to try to assure myself that I don't go there. You know what I'm saying? I can't even think about going back there. I tried my best today to give glory to God because I'm so scared of that place. But I'm very scared for the people who don't believe in it because it is so frightening. I'm sure that other people who have had these experiences felt different things in hell. Myself, all I felt was the separation from God. Not one other thing bothered me as far, you know what I'm saying? Like nothing else could ever overtake that pain and I couldn't believe that I was stuck here for eternity to be tortured and to always know that I had everything I had my wife I had my kids I had all the opportunities in the world and I didn't make any of them work I squandered everything and it had brought me to this point for eternity Now with all this going on, I'm praying to myself and I'm saying, Lord God, please look on my actions and look on, you know, how my heart is, you know what I mean? Like, any actions that I've done good, please, Father, you know, have mercy on me. Like, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. I've always loved you, but my actions didn't always show that. Many times I went against what you wanted. And I was begging and begging and all of a sudden this this light hit this cave where every divot was just sticking out and you could see everything in this cave now was lit up you knew instantly your soul knew this is Jesus everything was was stopped immediately all the screams stopped 
these demons and monsters that were pulling on me and, and hurting me were in these caverns. I could see them blinking, but they couldn't be in Jesus' sight. He shut it down. Now I went to look up and I thought, I better, I don't want to offend them. So I just looked down and I said, Lord God, I'm not worthy of you or anything. Please help me, Jesus. This and that. Next thing I know, I look up and here's Christ. Just right here. I'm on my knees. He's a couple feet up looking at me with this beautiful smile. With the biggest smile, the most. He's so beautiful. Uh, he had a, a white robe on with a brown sash. Yeah, I mean, he was unbelievably beautiful. He's darker than uh, a lot of the pictures that I've seen. But what an amazing sight. You know, really, truly. Unbelievable, you know. And I've been searching for a picture that comes close to showing, hey, this is what he looked like, you know. But uh, I haven't found one just like it yet. Um, now, as he looks at me, I'm thinking to myself, this is amazing, you know, this whole story. I know he crucified, he died for our sins and all that, but to see him, to know that you're sitting in front of the Son of God, that he's real, that he, he, he's taking time out to come to me, he's helping me in hell is unbelievable and I can't understand it to this day I still can't wrap my head around any of this you know um, I don't understand why I was saved or any of this but he looked at me with so much beauty like I was the best thing in the world and I thought to myself on earth I'm ready to kill myself and and this guy's looking at me like I'm the best thing he's ever seen and I, I couldn't you know right then you imagine what is happening here you know right then you understand the amount of mercy that he has the amount of love that he has for us it's unfathomable we can never understand to begin to understand it because we don't have love we don't have the capacity like that uh, it's unbelievable how much he loves us and I said I'm sorry and I love you and he grabbed me with his right arm pulled me up and we just ascended through this cave and into bliss you know into a blue sky of bliss and he said to me and I quote as we as he talked as we talked and conversed we all we, we talked telepathically there was no mouth movement at all or anything like that uh, he said and this is quote I am going to take away your sins you have suffered long enough and with that I was shocked because my my addictions are going, you know, they're the reason I'm I'm dying here, you know what I mean? This is the reason I was going to kill myself, because I can't live a life without addiction. So now he says, I'm going to take your addictions. You have suffered long enough. And I'm like, wow, you know, this is amazing. And uh, at another point I said to him, you know, just let me bring some of this back, please, Lord. You know, let me, let me bring some of this situation somehow in a bottle let me jar it let me do something but let me bring it back and show people and say hey look see this let them look at it and feel what I'm feeling and there wouldn't be any questions of what's right and wrong and it would solve a lot of the things on this earth everybody would understand you are the way but uh and this is funny you know he he, he always was smiling anyway but he just said to me that's not the way this works and I thought that that was funny coming from Jesus, you know. Maybe it's not, I don't know. That's how I took it, though. And uh, That's not the way this works. So, you know what, we have to go off of faith and hope that uh, people see, you know what I'm saying. But that's why I'm doing this, trying to tell my story and get it out to people because I don't want to show up in front of him again and say, hey, I didn't do nothing with what you did for me, man, you know. And uh, now I feel the time is right for me to start moving with the message and that's why I'm doing this but he took my addictions now when I woke up that night in bed whatever three o'clock in the morning something like that I woke my wife up and said to her it's over she said what's over I said Jesus took took my addictions and she said well hallelujah now my wife never says hallelujah you know and if you're an addict and you've been telling, you know, you've told everybody and their mother that you're going to quit, it's over, you're done, I'm going to live straight, everything's over, you know, it don't work. 
but here she she just accepted it totally so I thought about that and months later I asked her I said what did you see the Holy Spirit in my face is that why you said hallelujah and here I had forgot that she had contacts back then and her eyes weren't even in her contacts were you know not even in she couldn't see anything she said I couldn't see she's like I just felt something in your voice that put my soul at ease and I believed and I was like oh hallelujah so the amazing part is this of course it's amazing I've been to hell I've been with Christ himself and conversed and seen him and his beauty but from that moment of waking up I have never drank another beer done another drug hallelujah and it's not from me and it's not some mind thing uh, oh he had a dream and he talked himself into not drinking anymore and all that garbage new age things and philosophies and all that stuff you can keep it I was in hell and I seen Jesus and he rescued me from it and if he didn't I would have killed myself that following day no doubt no doubt in my mind so it's amazing because I drank every I drank at least every hour of the day you know I was high for years not days years weed drugs alcohol my body was on all the time I went to bed drunk woke up drunk you know I, that's how I rolled for years and to stop instantly to stop to where it, it, it's like it never it never existed you know and now my life uh, this is two and a half years now since this time and it, it, it's like it never happened to me I think of the old stuff I did the craziness the fighting you know the uh, tough guy you know construction drinking drugging you know all that alpha male fighting bull crap you know um, and it's all empty you know it's all junk and it's all real shallow and uh, you know, God took me from somebody like that to what I am today. Now, I'm not perfect by any means, and I'm a screw-up just like everybody else, but I'm trying my best and trying to give my life to Christ. And uh, it's amazing what He can do. He's taken me from that and who I used to be and, and shown me so many different things. I know my kids now. I know my wife now. I come home all the time now. I, I, uh, you know, my whole life is spent to have fun with them, make memories with them. You know, be the priest of this family, of my family, of making sure that we stay on point with God. You know what I'm saying? And, and we all have our own walk with Him and everything like that. And it's like beforehand, before this, we never, pr you know, I prayed with Him, but we never went to church or anything like that. Or, and it's amazing. It's really so amazing that it's very simple. Like the Bible says, knock and it will be opened. You know, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. You know, now I'm not a, a Bible quoting guy and all that, you know, and I'm really into the word now and trying, you know, to learn it. But uh, a lot of people can spit different uh verses and everything like that and that's awesome you know and we should know it as uh, lovers of Christ we should we should know the word of God so we can empower ourselves you know what I mean put the put the uh, armor of God on us but guys this is a uh, this is a true miracle a true miracle of life he simply just took my drug addiction and my alcohol addiction and took it away that's it no dream could ever do that you know I've had dreams before I'm still an addict when I wake up so for everybody out there that's trying to figure out how this happened you're staring at a miracle am I something special no I'm regular and I mess up every day you know what I mean but I am a miracle in the fact and in the eyes that Jesus Christ did come and pull me out of hell so I've been to hell and I've seen Jesus okay it's amazing and I want to share it with you because 
for all the addicts out there, for everybody who suffered through abuse and just thinks, you know, I just want to end it, you know, I just want to get out of here, I just want to kill myself because I can't deal with all this stuff. Uh, you know, I, I'm not making anybody happy. I ruin everything I, I ever touch. You know what I'm saying? That's what addiction will do. It'll rip every single thing in your life and trash it and make you feel so worthless. But really, guys, all we got to do is just lay it down. Lay it down. Take all of that negativity, every single thing that is on you and lay it down at the foot of his cross lay it down at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ and say I love you and please come into my heart and I can't deal with this I need your help because I can't deal with it please take it from me I can't deal with it and if you're not going to take it then give me the strength to get through this and that was one thing I remember saying to him you know when I was sitting playing with the gun I said Lord you know you say you never give me anything I can't handle. Well, I can't handle this, you know. And to see how he just came right in and stopped me at the most opportune time is amazing. I surely, it's hard for me to explain it to you. I'm sure, I really hope that you understand what I'm saying because uh, it's absolutely true. And as I tell you, I have the images in my head. I always have the image of Christ with me ever since. And I think that's because, uh, you know, sometimes the enemy will come in and say, that didn't happen, Jesus don't love you, this and that. But, you know, I just say, be gone, Satan. You know what I mean? I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ, because I can see Christ with me all the time. I'm very aware after this whole episode of spiritual warfare, you know, there is a battle for each and every one of our souls every day, gang, you know. And uh, I would just tell you that, I don't, I, I'm not here to preach about some church or this or that, Catholic, Protestant, whatever, okay? What I want to tell you is that Jesus Christ is real. He died for our sins. He is the Son of God. He loves us. Hallelujah. Believe it. His mercy is unfathomable. Give your life up to Him. If you come to Him, you will feel the Holy Spirit eventually. And the Holy Spirit, when that hits you, will light your body with so much energy that no drugs in the world could ever light your energy up. You know, give your body that kind of energy. It's amazing. So you will feel the Holy Spirit, you know. And as you go and you cleanse yourself and you try and do whatever you can do. But please don't get caught up in, in the times of where we're at. And all the things that are empty. If you notice people, you know, they'll, they'll buy this house, they'll buy this house. Even the multi-billionaires, you know, they'll buy a house that's $150 million, stay in it for two years, move to another one. Because why? That one wasn't good enough? You know? Because you're never going to quench your thirst. Everything is just for a season. No matter what you have, it's just for a season. I've known people with mansions and pools in their homes and elevators and you know all kinds of craziness thousands hundreds of thousands of dollar cars and all this and it's empty they don't care because they don't have what they're chasing and you know what in Christ Jesus that's the only thing that will quench your thirst gang the rest of these things are empty they're for image they're for self and uh, I really hope that you just come to Jesus. Forget about whatever churches you look at and you want to do. And God bless you with whatever. Keep Jesus your focus. Pray. Pray in private. Fast. Don't tell people when you're fasting. Somebody's bothering you, pray for them. Help the poor. Help the people in need. Help those that nobody's helping. Go help the homeless. You know, it's funny, they got all these things that are all over the place with help the dogs, help the animals, oh, homeless dogs. And, you know, what about people? You know, we're in America. You know, you're worried about housing a dog. House the guy that's down the block. You know what I'm saying? Look at a human. You know, because in order to help a human, it really takes something. To get a dog, don't take much. Human, you really got to show. So, what's your character? 
Guys, I don't know the answers. All I do know is this. Jesus Christ is real. He loves you. My advice to you is to pray to Jesus. Read the Bible. It's the Word of God. And try and live your life by it. You'll see that doing that, your life will change. Things will get better. And miracles will come up upon you in your own way. And it may not be the way I did it, you know. And chances are it probably won't because that's an amazing event. And at the same time that I was saved and he came to hell to get me, somebody else on this earth had killed themselves over the same addictions and things that I had been through at the same point. But they were allowed to kill themselves and I was intervened for. So I just want to tell you, I love you as I pray that I see you as all in heaven. Do your best. Give glory to God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah and God bless you. Hey gang, um, I'm doing this video for just to tell you how important things are here. I mean, we have, uh, this life is a vapor of eternity. That's all it is. This life is a breath of eternity. And depending on how we live this life is going to depend on the rest of our eternal souls, where we go. Now, I was in hell. I felt the total separation from God. Um, the, the screams, I mean, these people are in hell right now. There's people, and when I was in hell, I was in, the, I was in the center of the earth, and I knew it. And these people are still beneath our feet right now. These souls are burning in torment beneath our feet, however many miles it is to the center or wherever it's at there that's where they're at so they're in the center of the earth looking up they're looking up wishing that they had just a second to come back here to repent to give their life to jesus christ but it's too late and we're here just for such a minute second out of eternity it's this life so what i'm saying here is that th this is like there's nothing in this world that should interest you you know, this world is just, it's dead, it's dying. Everything in it is dying. Look at society. This place is, is an antichrist society at every angle you look at. Everything in society takes you away from Jesus Christ. And you have this prosperity message out there in these mainstream churches today and claim it and this and that. And it's like people are sitting here trying to accumulate things and materials. And you're accumulating things and materials and property and saving money. And for what? Because you can't bring anything with you when you leave here. No matter who you are, how much money you have, when you die, you're going right before the Lord. That's it. You, leave, you take nothing with you. This place, we are saving treasures up here for nothing. And then we have to walk into eternity not prepared at all. Now I'm telling you, when I was... When I, when I first seen Jesus, when I had, you know, I had been going to church, Catholic church at that time, and I had been going to church every time to see the Lord, four or five times a day. And then I realized that the Lord is with us. The Lord is inside of us. If we empty ourselves out, emptying ourselves out, I mean every day you have to empty yourself out. When I mean, give glory to God. Give, empty yourself out. Lord, take away my, my humanness. Take away my fleshly desires. Take away the things of my heart. Take away, let me die to this ego and pride of this world and let me be humble and let me try and walk with you and all these things and focus on the Lord. And then throughout that day, it's very easy to focus on the Lord because everything that you're doing, you're already mindful. I'm not going to take part in this conversation. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And the Holy Spirit will lead you through things. You navigate through your day relying on the Holy Spirit. As we empty ourselves out, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us. If we just wake up and rush out and go here and there and here and there, then all you'll see that you'll take part in those conversations because your soul's already beaten down, because you're, you're already too confused. And this society today has everybody running in circles for a certain reason. For, that's by agenda. That's been created, this situation that you live in with so many distractions and everything like that because the enemy wants you distracted from God. So how many of you wake up in the morning and just take that time, whatever it is, 15, 20 minutes, half hour, and just give it to God? Just lay there and relax. And you say you don't have time, but you do have time. Many people say, I don't have time. I just, uh, you know, and they give God their little grocery list prayer, their drive through prayer of what they want, and that's it. They go to church their hour a week, and they feel, well, they're doing him a favor or something. They know him. 
And what I'm calling you out to do is to come know him yourself. To die to yourself every day. Ask God in the morning, first thing, please empty me out. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. Help me to represent you today and be the light in this dark world. Help me. Help me to come out of this world because we're called out of this world. But see, so many people are listening to these messages of prosperity, this and that. Did Jesus come here in a prosperous situation? Was he born in some kind of castle or kingdom or, you know, born to anything of lavishness? No. Was he trying to acquire the things of this world? No. Did he conform? Was he politically correct? Not at all. But you'll have people who will say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I want to chase these things that he did not chase. And Jesus tells us that if you love the world, that the love of the Father is not in you. That we are to come out of this world, that we are in it, but not of it. Obviously, we're here, but we're not to be of it. We're not to take part in the things of this world. So come out of this thing. Come out of this world. Come out of society. Believe me, if society loves you, then you're not walking with the Lord. Because when we walk with the Lord, we're persecuted. We are the oddballs. We are the ones who everybody says, you're crazy. You're crazy. What is wrong with you? Who cares if we watch this movie or listen to this music? It's no big deal. It's no big deal if we celebrate this or take part in this or that. He knows our hearts. It's okay. It's okay if we just chase this money and chase this and chase that to acquire things and all this. It's like Jesus Christ is alive and I never knew that. I never knew that. When I would go to church, I would pray and, and things like that. And I didn't know that I could have a personal relationship. I didn't know that I could pray to Jesus Christ. I didn't know that the Lord will lead us through the Holy Spirit. I didn't understand that. And so many people believe that they're just going to heaven. They go one hour a week and they feel like, hey, you know what, you're, let, you're allowing, you're relying on some person, pastor, priest, whatever, to bring you Jesus Christ. And you're not understanding that in many cases, these are businesses. You know, they have to bring people back next week because if people were speaking the truth from the pulpits today, then you wouldn't have anybody coming back to church because nobody wants to hear it. Today, everybody wants their own right and wrong, their own, you know, they want to just be tickled in their ears. They don't want truth. They don't want to hear about repentance. They don't want to hear that hell is real. And as I made this video, I'm seven minutes in, I, how many countless number of souls have dropped into hell? You know how many people end up in hell and they never even know that it exists? He brought me there to warn people, to come to you and say, hey, look, I don't have some theologian background. I don't have this or that. I didn't come from prestige or anything like that. But I'm telling you that hell is real. I'm telling you with all of me that hell is real. I know I'm on borrowed time. I know I've seen this place. I've seen these demons, guys. I've seen demons in the physical. Just as I'm in standing here talking to you, I've had the Holy Spirit on me and seen demons in this world. I've seen these things. This is real. This isn't, you know, some people are wondering, is it real? Is it this? Is it that? You're, you know, the, the enemy that we fight is a spiritual enemy. That is who we fight. It's not the, not the human people you can see. Our battle is with the things that, of the unseen that we cannot see. You have to come to Jesus Christ, pull out of this world. If you say you're following the Lord, then how can you take part or justify that you love the world? You love the Lord, but you love the world. You love the Lord, but you're chasing the money. You're chasing the things, the prestige, the, the materialism of this world. You accept it by society because if you're a man of God, if you're walking with the Lord, then society will reject you. It's an antichrist society. They give you men of God, but very few of them are bringing you truth or truth about repentance or this or that. There's an agenda. They're always trying to twist you to lean towards this or that or prepare you for what's to come. Or, and, and you're blind, and you're not going about seeking a personal relationship on your own. People are saying, well, can you pray and this and that? Well, pray for yourself. Get on your knees. You want to find God? You seek and you shall find. You want to ask Jesus into your heart? Then do it. Get on your knees and cry out and beg for him to come into your heart. Repent of the way that you've lived, the things that you have done. Don't be this. If you pay attention to this society, if you allow it in, if you allow the things of this world, which come at a thousand miles an hour from every direction to influence your life, then you won't be able to understand anything. You won't be able to even focus on God because you can't even focus on your own life. They keep you so busy. Come out of this thing. You don't have to be so busy. When you say you don't have time, if you take away that garbage TV that you watch for five hours a day and these bogus reality shows and every other thing and these movies and this and that, then you have plenty of time right there for God. Instead of watching the TV, go lay on your face. 
Go get on your knees. Go get to know God. Go ask him into your heart, and you'll be shocked when he does lead you. You'll be shocked when the Holy Spirit overcomes you. And now I see where he's led me. But many people are going to be drawn in here, guys, and I'm calling you. If you're just going and you're chasing the world and the materials of it, it's like ask yourself, is this what Jesus wanted? Did he want you to conform? Did he want you to be politically correct? Didn't he lay out what he wanted? And if he says that if you love the world and the love of the Father is not in you, then how do you justify that? Or do you just say, well, I listen to this, but I don't believe in this. Believe me, you need to come to Jesus Christ on your own. And repentance, God offers repentance to everybody if you want to take it. But people love their sin too much. They love the way they live. They don't want to have to believe that they have to die to this world because they're in the world. And when you die to the world, then you're the weirdo. Then you're the Jesus nut. Then you're the guy who's in the cold or this or that. And that's how it comes about. Then your family starts to say, you're crazy. Your family who likes this or that, you know, and that's, they want to go to Protestant church or Catholic church. And, you know, everybody always believes they have the truth. Protestant, this, that. Everybody believes they have the truth. This church has a truth and you don't. That's how it is. And that's the problem. When you, did, when you give your allegiance to a church and their mission statement, blah, 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 blah. If you don't follow one or two of those things, all of a sudden you're the weirdo. Well, he don't believe in this or that. And that's not even the case. There's no mission statement with Jesus Christ. It's come. It's humiliate yourself. Be humble. It's come and say, I can't do any of this alone. I need you. I can't breathe without you. Everything I've ever had, have, or will have is only because of you and your grace and your mercy upon me. I've had this vision for years now, and I'll share it with you. It's me in the middle of these dense forests. Okay, I'm in a clearing, maybe a hundred foot clearing, circle clearing, and I am there naked and just like shivered up like this, okay? As I'm looking around the circle, there's wolves all around the circle. I can see the eyes of these wolves, hundreds of wolves just circling around. None of them have been in the clearing. They don't step into the clearing, but they are focusing on me the whole time. And I know and I'm aware, and I've had this vision probably ten times over the last ten years that God's hand is on me, and that's why these wolves cannot come. But if he were to take his hand off, then they could attack. There's a reason why these wolves cannot attack, because it's God's hand. It's God's presence on me. And I can tell you this. I was praying the other day. I'll share this with you. I was praying. I was wondering, Lord, thank God I haven't been attacked in so many horrible ways. You know, like I've had my share of life, you know what I mean, and experiences. But a lot of people throughout my life, even on YouTube here, have said, though, place curses and all kinds of stuff, right? They're going to send all kinds of stuff. And in the beginning, I used to think about it, and now it's like I don't even care. But the Lord put it on me. You have no idea of what I protected you from. So understand that. No matter what we go through, a lot of times we like to say, oh, I can't believe, look at me, poor me, this, that, look at the thing. But we don't know what God has stopped. We don't know what he has held back from us. We don't know what he intervened for and stopped from even coming our way. And that's what we cannot possibly understand about God. So remember, we're creation, and he's the creator. We're never going to fully understand, but come out of this world. We're called to do it. Leave the music. Leave the TV shows. Leave this movies. It's doing nothing but dumbing you down. It takes your time. It takes your focus off of God, and it, it brings you right into the philosophy that this world's trying to program you with, to accept. They don't want you to... They don't want you to have your own mindset. They don't want you chasing God. They don't want you pulling out of them, unplugging from their system. They want you to just be a good little sheep being led to the slaughter. And believe me, hell is a real place. And just as we did this video here, many souls have fell, fallen into hell all around this world. And many of them believe that they weren't going to go to hell. So come out of this stuff. Stop relying on someone else to bring you Jesus Christ. Come and get on your knees, get on your face, cry out to God, ask for repentance, repent of everything you've ever done, ask forgiveness, ask him into your heart, and he will come into your heart, he's truly alive, he works miracles every day, countless miracles, he saved me from hell and took my addictions. Believe me, hell's a real place, don't listen to people that say it's not. Don't follow the world, if you're following the mainstream, you're in trouble, you have to fight the current. Believe me, you, can, you have to fight the, you have to be opposed to what popular belief is. And popular belief, we know we're in an antichrist system. We know this is Satan's world here. We know that the most influential people in this world are in Satan's pocket. And they're going to lead you astray if you want to be led astray. So what I'm telling you is to repent, to come out of this world, and to follow Jesus Christ, and to empty yourself out every day, and to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and lead you. 
in all that you do, and you will feel it. And he will help you to navigate through your day. He will help you to navigate through your life. And when you do turn off the TV and these movies and, and you get rid of this music and instead of listening to music, you pray. Or instead of watching TV, you pray. You will see your soul's going to just be energized. That the Holy Spirit will come and fill you with such love and peace instead of the, the, the garbage that you're filling yourself with otherwise. Please, guys. It's a distraction, I'm telling you, to come out of this world. Get on your knees and ask Jesus, and don't rely on some preacher or priest to bring you Jesus Christ. Get on your knees and seek him now. Seek him now. Call out on him. Nobody else has any different, you know, line to Jesus than you do. The Pope is just a man also. He doesn't have some divine thing to, to Jesus that you don't have. You don't have to ask for someone else to take your prayers to Jesus Christ. Take your prayers yourself to Jesus Christ. Get on your knees and call out on Jesus. He listens to you. They don't want you knowing that. It, he listens to you. Get on your knees and cry out. He loves us all. You have to repent. You have to come to him. Come out of this world, guys, and empty yourselves out each day. Each day seek the Lord. God bless you guys. Hell is definitely real. It's real very much real carl knighton knows what hell is like because he says he went there after he accidentally overdosed on a drug called valium like the bible says you in torment even though it happened more than 20 years ago carl was able to draw pictures of what he says he encountered in hell the one in the middle they they trying to get out out of uh, out of the fire but it is no there's no way they can get out there's no hope for them uh there's no way of escape for them Carl grew up in a Christian home where he had been taught that heaven and hell were real places. Even as a child, he was sensitive to the things of God. I always felt the presence of God. I've seen angels of God at a young age and that let me know that God was with me. After high school, Carl joined the army and married. Both his marriage and his military career were short-lived. And platoon leader, I mean platoon star and squad leader would come to me and, and they say, Oh, you're not doing your job, and you should be doing better than this, and you're not going to never make uh, the next rank. And so I got really frustrated. Carl decided it was time to get out of the Army by going AWOL. He hitchhiked to Ohio to see an old friend. He then went on a two-week drug binge. One night, Carl went to a crack house in the worst part of Columbus, Ohio. You can smell the stench of the the crack cocaine, you can smell the stench of the marijuana. People was high and laying all across the, the, the floors. Carl smoked some crack and started drinking alcohol and using other drugs. But he says he believes it was the last pill he took that sent him on a journey to hell. And I took that volume, and before I knew it, I fell off the couch onto the floor. It was pitch black dark. I began to quiver. I began to have the shakes, and I began going down and down and down like a deep uh, pit, and I saw smelling the stench of hell. It's the most rottenest thing that you can ever smell in your life. In fact, you can't even imagine it. I began to feel a tugging and pulling, like the Bible says, demons tug and nag at you. They was calling my name. Boy, say, we got you, we got you, we got you. You belong to us now. I saw souls, lost souls that was in torment in the lake of fire. They was crying and calling on God. They was hopeless. And I called on the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, help me, Jesus, help me, Jesus. And soon I called on his name. I saw the hand of God snatch me out of hell and my spirit went back into my body. Carl says that he was in hell for more than half an hour. I was shaking and trembling, and I turned my head to the right. <laughs> and they said I was dead. And they said that was there for 30 to 35 minutes. But I know that was a loving God that loved me so much. Three days later, Carl returned to Fort Eustis, Virginia to face the consequences of going AWOL. He was demoted and confined to the barracks for one month. During that time alone, he completely surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. I immediately asked the Lord to forgive me, repent, put them sins behind me, go forward 
and God, I really gave my life back to Christ after that. Today, Carl is married again. He's also on a mission to tell as many people as he can about the reality of heaven and hell. God loved me so much. He loved me so much that he gives me a second chance. And I'm here to tell the story. Not a story, but the true testimony. How awesome God is. And people will only listen. And don't take God for granted. Don't throw your life away. Accept Jesus as your Savior. The last thing the devil wants you to do is hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will do anything to keep your mind, your eyes, your ears off the message of the gospel. Hell is a real place. Men may laugh and they may make jokes about the existence of such a place as hell. Natural instinct is either to ignore it to not think about it whatsoever or to deny it. Men really don't want to hear about hell and they want to make it the brunt of jokes. They want to make the devil to be a little horned figure with a pitchfork because they don't want to hear that their sin one day is going to be punished in such a way that I want to tell you defies description. It defies description. And so they make statements to the effect, once the jokes are over and past and beyond, it's something like, well, you know, God is such a God of love and mercy that he wouldn't punish somebody in hell forever. God is saying, in essence, I don't bend my law. I will not tolerate sin to go unpunished. I will not wink my eye. I will not pass over transgression. Sin must be punished. God is love. Blessed be his name for that truth. But God is holy. And this God loves holy. This God loves purity. The only two emotions proper to God are love and wrath. Love and wrath. You young people who know not the Lord, you listen to me. There will be no tears from your mom and dad on that day. Plenty of tears in this life. They have pled with you, they have prayed for you to come, to come to Jesus Christ, to turn from your life of sin, to put your trust in Him. And you have laughed and spurned all their pleas. But on that day, on that day, when, they, when the Lord says, bind him hand and foot, your mom and dad who have been redeemed are going to say, Amen. God's will be done. Everything changes that. How you look at things completely changed that day. Turn and live. Repent and believe. Come to Christ. And if you go the rest of your days, however long that is, disobeying that gospel command to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to find out the reason for hell. There is a price to pay, and God says you're going to pay it. Now you tell me, preacher, you're just trying to scare me. You're dead right. You're dead right. You ought to be scared to death of hell. Your companions of hell will be sodomites and lesbians and murderers and churchgoers and Sunday school teachers. And preachers, these shall go away. The company that makes up hell, the damned, the wicked, 
It's a world where a place of unfailing memory. Your memory will be alive and well. If you are found that day, and I am there at the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to see you bound hand and foot. You're going to remember me. And down in the pit of hell, you're going to remember every time your minister said, Now is the time. Now is the day of salvation. You're going to remember. You're going to remember your mom and your dad pleading with you, and yes, perhaps arguing with you. Because they didn't want to see you go down to hell. You're going to remember all the opportunities you had. That, that the Christianity is just going to mess my life up. And all my friends and my, what will they say about me? Who cares? Who cares what they'll say? Hell is real. Maybe this will be the last time you'll hear my voice. Maybe this will be the last time you'll hear some preacher say, Now's the time. One more time I ask you, will you come? I plead with you. Will you come tonight? And the Lord pleads with you. Don't wait. What would you do if God or if Jesus came back and you say, but God, I was going to come. I was going to come up. And it would be too late. <laughs> Think about that, y'all. Don't wait. Don't wait. Just come up. It's not worth it. This is the day. This is the hour. Satan, you can't have them any longer. Yes. They are God's property. Yes. And we command you to take your hands off of the property of God. Lord, we claim them and we plead the blood of Jesus right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 지옥으로 가는 수많은 자들의 고통을 호소하는 소리가 하늘을 찌른다. 주님, 이 아이는 몇 살인가요? 아이는 아홉 살이고 초등학생이었다. 주님, 이 아이가 왜 이런 고통을 겪나요? 아이가 지옥에 있는 것이 정말 믿기지 않고 너무 무서웠습니다. 이 아이는 부모가 하지 말라는 것을 하며 사탄이 이 아이를 쓰고 살았다. 입이 거칠고 어린 나이에 어른의 이성문화에 빠져 살던 아이이며 그 뇌가 이미 병들어 부모도 고칠 수 없는 정신병이 든 아이였다. 이 아이 주변에는 벌레들이 기어다니고 있으며 벌거벗은 아이의 온몸을 갈가먹고 파헤치고 해집고 다녔습니다. 주님, 어린아이들을 어떻게 해야 하나요? 이들은 회개하면 안 되나요? 선악을 구분할 수 있고 천국과 지옥을 알며 스스로 판단할 수 있는 아이들이 이렇게 타락하여 죄의 주관권에 빠져 살다 보면 회개는커녕 아무렇지도 않게 자신과 상대에게 해를 가하고 놀리고 참소하며 죄들을 짓는다. 세상에는 이런 아이들이 너무 많다. 이들이 회개하지 않고 사고나 병이 들어 죽게 되면 사탄들이 끌고 와 각종 감옥에서 지옥살이를 시킨다. 
1972, okay. I was 25 years old. Okay. My family was broken. My marriage was broken. My health was broken. I was actually living on the street of Atlanta, Georgia, sleeping in a box. Mm. My mind had left me. I'd done so much drugs and alcohol. Going all the way back, I, I grew up in the mountains, the Appalachian Mountains. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a drunkard. My grandfather had a moonshine steel. I learned to cut and shoot and do all those things growing up, but never learned about Jesus or God or church or anything. What's cut, What's and, cut shoot? and shoot? What's that's cut and shoot? Cut, cut, cut people, cut. cut people, cut and shoot. Oh, that's cut. that's cut Appalachian shoot Road. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Cut and shoot. <laughs> cut. Okay. Cut, okay. and and shoot. Shoot. Okay. Okay. cut and I, shoot. Okay. Cut and shoot. Okay. I like wow. the President Reagan's okay. brother. Wow. Just a little bit better than this. Okay. <laughs> I told you I was from Tennessee. Okay. Okay. The mountains of eastern Tennessee. So that was your upbringing <laughs> in, in a in a. That was re, that was your life. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Very, now you're in a box. Strong. Wait. Okay. You're in a box in Atlanta. Sleeping, mm -hmm. your mind is because of alcohol. Did you know you were in such a state, or are you just kind of tripping so far you didn't really even know it? Probably uh, from the time I was nine years old, Matt, it, it started. Um, someone gave me a baby lamb. I had to walk two miles to catch the school bus, and, and we never had anything. We never had electricity or running water and uh, had free lunches at school. But someone gave me a baby lamb on the way home one day, and, and it became very precious to me as a nine-year-old child in an abusive home. And my father beat that lamb to death in, in front of me, butchered it, killed it. At nine years old, uh, my heart just became hard. I began to scream, ran off into the mountains, screaming, he's killed my lamb. But I made a promise that I'd never shed another tear, mm. and anybody that got hurt from there on, it would be someone else. I knew nothing about evil, but at nine years old, a spirit of rebellion came into my life. And from that point on, I was uh, throwing rocks at police and trying to burn down the schoolhouses and stealing cars. I stole a car and wound up killing some people and went into reform school and kind of grew up in the, in the reform school and saw people raped and, and killed and hanged themselves. But my heart just got harder and harder mm -hmm. and harder. So by 1972, I, I was married. I'd been kicked out of school even before I went to the reform school. But I met this little girl. She was 15 years old. Mm. Wow. And I was about 16 and a half when we got married. Wow. And uh, we didn't know. All I knew was hatred and violence. And her father was a bartender in Chicago. And, but she didn't have the violence that I had. But I brought her into that lifestyle. And and begin robbing and traveling all over the country. Together? Together, robbing stores. You were like a and, Bonnie and Clyde oh, yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, Are I'm you kidding me? I'm serious. No, look at her. I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. Hurt anybody. Yeah. Now, Matt and I have done some fun yeah. things. But yeah. <laughs> I waited in the car. Wow. Yeah, she you were the getaway driver? She was driver. a getaway driver. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. I've never met a getaway yeah. driver. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. She's right a pretty enough. good driver. You know, so. <laughs> but she, she had wow, a good teacher. Wow, you guys. Her, her dad hauled moonshine whiskey, so she had a good teacher, you know. Yeah. A, a person. <laughs> Knew how to get out of town. Huh? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so wow. this really ha You're not making any of this no, up. Sir. You're not. No, you, you got this a criminal happened. record, apparently, yes. as long as you're on. Wow. Yes. Okay. Now, very did you know what drew me. you to this kid? <laughs> yeah. What'd you say? They never caught me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're watching right now. Yeah. <laughs> There's a police officer standing right there. I know. I know. Okay. Funny okay. thing about it, my son's a police officer. Yeah. Can you believe? Wow. He's got a sense of humor. Okay, what in the world happened? Okay, so take us to your departure from this earth. What happened? Okay, in uh, the late 60s, uh, in that condition, I was arrested and actually broke out of the jail, Fulton County Jail in Atlanta, Georgia. Wow. It's, it's, it's documented. <laughs> and <laughs> but it's past the statute of limitations. So, yeah. okay. Thank you, so you great hair now, see? Yeah. Yeah. Great hair. So, wow. But here's what happened. I called. See, she had to leave with our babies.
Mm -hmm. uh, she almost committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Had had Billy Graham not come on television oh, come and, on and spoke to her heart through a little black and white TV set <laughs> and warned about the dangers of hell, had God not spoke through him to her, she left, took the kids, and went back home. So I just went deeper and deeper. But after breaking out of jail, I called her and said, can I have another chance? I really would like to be a father. I would like oh, to wow. be a husband. And, a, and, and my kids love me. And she said, so we'll try it. And we did try. She tried to help me. She'd lock me up in the <laughs> bathroom, in the bedroom, and I'd break the doors down That's and throw them out it. the windows. I had to get to the drugs and the wow. alcohol. And, but in 1972, uh, I went down to the corner market. My little son was with me. He was five years old. And I was a violent person, man. I mean, I, I'm ashamed of it now, but I was, I was full of it. And I walked into that market, and a man was coming out the door, and he shoved the door, and I shoved the door, but that's all it took. I exploded in anger and busted his head, knocked him down in the floor, and, and people were screaming. My little son saw all this, and, but that man didn't stay down. He got up with a broken 16-ounce glass bottle and started stabbing me. The very first stab severed the biceps muscle and the arteries and the ligaments in, in, my, in my left arm. And every time my heart would beat, the blood was just pumping out on the floor. In my anger, I'm still trying to hit this guy, and he's cutting me and cutting me. But they, they said, if you don't get to a hospital, you're going to bleed to death. And they put me in the passenger side of a car and drove me to the nearest hospital. By the time I got there, it, I was virtually dead. I almost bled to death. Well, they tried to help me and stabilize me and put me in an ambulance to send me to a bigger hospital. And in the back of that ambulance, laying there, 25 years old, I, with bleeding ulcers and, and my hair falling out and a nervous wreck and, and no reputation, a young man looked down into my face, a paramedic, and said, Sir, do you know Jesus Christ? Hello. Wow. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know what he was talking about. I was so paranoid. If anything uh, intimidated me, I lashed out at it. Wow. It made me angry and worse. So I started cussing him and his Jesus. I cursed, and that's all I knew, that's all I knew. And he kept saying, Jesus loves you. If you'll call on him, he'll help you. And as he was speaking to me about this, the ambulance, I thought, blew up. I mean, it, it caught on fire, and the, and the thing filled full of smoke, and I thought it was an electrical fire. So I'm laying here near death, and the, the thing is so full of smoke, I can't breathe. She's in the ambulance with me. And, and I, I, worse than that, my body felt like it began to just come up off the gurney and float away. And I began to hear people screaming and crying and groaning, and I didn't, I didn't know what that was. And then when I began to see out of this thick smoke that was choking me, I'm looking into what looked like the open mouth of a, of a volcanic crater, a burning crater. And I'm falling into this thing with no, just no help. And worse than that, I begin to see people in this fire. And they're screaming and crying and they're burning, but, but they're not burning up. Wow. Now, now, I've been shot and cut and had things done to me that I won't even talk about here. Got high on pain, got to a point in my life that I hated everything and everybody. But this did something to me. I didn't know what it was. And when I looked into the face of men that I saw shot to death in liquor store robberies, and I saw people that died of drug overdoses and died drunk in automobile accidents, and they're screaming at me and calling my name and telling me to go back, to not come there. There's no escape. There's no way out. And I'm just falling into this, and I don't understand what it is, but I can't breathe, and, and the stench is awful, and the, the depression is awful. You will rarely find a message now on repentance.
Look at what has become of the world, Church of Christ, through you, losing what you should have been. But God waits for His people. God waits for His people. When will they take the stepping stones God has placed in His Word? church that has forgotten its foundations, a church that's turned away from its beginnings and begins to become a harlot church. Just, just tell me how blessed I am. Just tell me I'm, I'm, I'm going to be powerful and popular and going to have no trouble in my life. For the, just tell me these things. Watered down. Half truths. This gospel says, just believe and get saved. There's nothing of repentance. Nothing of godly sorrow. Nothing of turning from your sins. Nothing about taking up your cross and following the Lord. But people who say a little prayer said, you're fine, you're good. People believe that any standard, even if the New Testament is legalism and bondage and law. Any standard is law. I'm under grace, I can do anything. Oh, that's from the devil. Now we've revised that and said, if you can get people for one hour on Sunday morning in the building, that's the church. That's not the church. We can use every device we want to get people for one hour and keep it early and keep it moving and keep it going. But that's not the church Jesus built. And I'm embarrassed to be part of the church of Jesus today because I believe it's an embarrassment to a holy God. Most of our joy is clapping our hands and having a good time and then afterwards we're talking all the dribble of the world. Don't talk to us about holiness or separation from the world. Don't, we don't want to hear of that, folks. People today don't want to hear anything they call gloom and doom. If, if it's not smooth, it's gloom and doom. Well, friend, let me tell you lovingly, go to hell and live with all the scum of the earth. You like to drink, go with the drinkers. You like to lust, go with the prostitutes. To have been covered in something deceptive to find in the last moments of your life that the feet coming down the hallway are not taking you to heaven. You can get through the deception your whole life. You can even sing in the choir. And I think we better watch this business of, you know, God loves you, God loves you, and all the bumper sticker sloppy evangelism. Will you remind people of the goodness and the severity of God? Will you remind them that there's a day when mercy is cut off forever? Will you remind them that people pray in hell but nobody ever answers? But in spite of what God has spoken, they create a garment of fig leaves and they cover themselves and say, all is well, all is well. And they seek out a church that won't challenge their sin, that won't expose this hypocrisy for what it is. I'd rather you get mad at me and go to heaven. This so-called love gospel today only reaches the flesh. It can't get to the heart. It can't dig into sin so that there can be a cleansing. And if I'm a surgeon of the Holy Ghost, I'm not going to put a bandage on you when you've got cancer sticking out of a bone or, or on your flesh. We're going to say, hey, we got to get in there. It has to be dealt with. And we do. I don't care if you like me, but I'm a good surgeon and I know what I'm doing and I'm going to get your cancer out. This is the reason why some who are listening even now and will be listening to tapes in the future. You just can't lighten up and enjoy these theologically shallow experiences like so many around you are today. Everyone around you is saying, oh, lighten up, lighten up. God's love, God's good, God's kind, God is nice. Come to church in your Bermuda short. Stick your feet on the altar rail. Have a coffee and cookies with us. We'll hear three point messages on nothing about God. But there's a stirring in you. There's a stirring in the true bride in this generation. And I'm going to tell you something. A diluted gospel is no gospel at all. Businessmen. They were crass businessmen coming into something that God said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. You're getting over on the people. Out with you. And if you don't believe this is happening in our generation, I challenge you to go to a Christian bookstore this week and Find the best sellers. Ask them which are the best sellers and look at them. Look at the covers of the images of men, not the images of God. Five steps to be like me. Five steps to better yourself. Five steps to the new you. Five steps to a wonderful destiny with their glossy faces on the cover. Not so subtly telling the church of Jesus Christ, if you use the principles of God, 
you will look like me. In the 14th chapter of Romans, and he says we, so he writes home, even to believers at the judgment seat. We must all, there's no exception. We must stand at the judgment seat of Christ. You can't send your lawyer, you can't send a representative. Because one day, it doesn't matter if your friends approve of you, it doesn't matter how many albums you sell, one day the Bible says, I'm going to stand in front of the one whose eyes are like fire and I can't get over on him. All of you that sing in that choir, it's not just if you're on your note, it's why you're on your note. Can you see all the saints of all the ages and Leonard Rayville is standing there before a, a Christ whose eyes are full of holiness, where the place is breeding holiness, where there's all the majesty of an awesome God? And he reads the record of my poor life before all the saints of all the ages. Answer God, all you theologians reasoning out my theology. Just answer God, are you pure in heart? And you became enamored with your own beauty. And your whole theological focus now is how you can be smarter, better, better looking, more prosperous. You lost the call of God, church. You made it a place just to make a buck. So out with you. Church of Christ with God, when will you grieve more? I'm the first of the righteousness. Now I'm going to tell you something. A diluted gospel is no gospel at all. To come new, but when the church is in the state we are, the standard is not preached or lived or presented. We need to seek God back for the standard of this book, not men's standard. What Christ says, I'm not presenting to you some holiness of a holiness movement. I'm teaching to you Christ's word that the only holiness is not heresy. I want to challenge you with everything in me. Put away lifeless religion. Put away empty pursuits of God. Put away all of the deception of the carnal nature. Holy, be ye holy, for I am holy. That's God's words, not mine. Would to God that Episcopalian, Presbyterian, Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal pastors begin to stand up and see what's happening to the church that was once called the church of Jesus Christ. Backsliding, turning apostate, turning against the truths of their, heaven, of their, their founding fathers. When I see the church in the New Testament, they didn't have stately buildings. They didn't have paid evangelists. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have organization. They did, couldn't get on TV and beg. But I'll tell you what they did. They turned the world upside down. But yeah, are you big enough to say, Lord, in this crucial hour in human history, let me fill up the sufferings of Christ. But if the Holy Spirit is truly, truly upon you in this generation, you will not be satisfied. You will not be found among those who sit in supposed houses of God with your feet on the altar rail and a cup of coffee in your hand listening to a PowerPoint sermon about a Christ they don't know. You'll not be satisfied. Because if you're going to get mature in God, all the dwarfs around you will criticize and sneer at you and say you're trying to be holier than the rest of us, eh? For God has not merely given us Jesus Christ, He's given us all things. And because there isn't enough joy in the house of God, we need entertainment. Because entertainment is the devil's substitute for joy. We're living in a time, as the prophet Malachi said, when those who feared the Lord are going to get together one more time and think on His name, and a book of remembrance will be written for them, and they will return, and they will know the difference between those who serve God and those who don't serve Him. Folks, we've got to deal with sin. We've got to deal with things in our life. You know, they're divorcing and all these things. We have to do something about it. We have to face a holy God one day. There's a great trial coming, folks, for everyone. Praise God. He's going to deliver the true believer. I want you to change your message. I'm telling you now, the judgment is at the door. The handwriting is on the wall. The whole world is shaking, and you're amusing this people. Even if you have to bury your theology, sir, just bury it tonight and get right with God. So turn from your sin, for all this society is about to come under the justice of God. Hell, of course, is the most hated truth in the world today. Most gospel ministers don't preach about it. Many gospel preachers don't believe it anymore. Even in some Pentecostal circles, they don't believe 
there is a hell. They say it's incompatible with the preaching of God's love. They say, how can uh, a God of mercy send anybody to a burning pit of everlasting hell? But Jesus was the very first to warn of hell. He said, whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. Jesus warned Capernaum, Bethsaida, and everyone who would reject his word, he said, you shall be brought down to hell. Jesus said, you serpents, generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Jesus preached more about hell than he did about heaven. Jesus was the greatest preacher on hell in all this living word. Now let me try to explain to you from the word of God what hell is going to be like. Now let me start by saying that when I preached this message for the first time here in New York City, a young man was visiting from uh, Canada. And he had a, a, a bodysuit on, flesh-colored bodysuit. The only flesh he had was in his hands and his face. He had been burned over 90% of his body. He'd been one of 10, uh, 12 men on an oil rig in Canada when it caught fire. Now, just two weeks prior to this, he had, he had joined this uh, oil team, and he was on this rig. And when they go back after all day work, they went back to the bunkhouse, and he was mocked and ridiculed because he's a good, strong Christian. He really loved the Lord. And he was particularly harassed by a young man on, on the job who just night and day said, I don't want to hear any of this Jesus garbage. I don't want to hear anything you have to say about it. And he's the kind of one that boasted, well, when I die, just before I die, I'll get right with God. And folks, this is why this message has to be preached. Some people have the idea, well, even if there is a hell, at the last moment, somehow I'll cry out to God. He'll have mercy and he'll save me. The mockery went on for two weeks. This young man made up his mind the next day to quit. He said, I can't handle this mockery anymore. He's about to leave, but the night, the, just that night before he was to quit, there was an explosion on the oil rig. I think there were three who were killed instantly. And the rest were burned, uh, different parts. This boy was burned 90% of his body. And, and uh, he heard the screaming and the flesh burning. And, he, he, he was running himself, but he saw this young man who had mocked him so much, and he saw him on fire, and he pulled him away from the blaze, and he was nothing, honestly, charcoal, he said, his hands frozen up, he had uh, nothing left but his eyeballs, his ears were gone, his nose was gone, everything was gone. Did he cry out to God? He said, Brother Wilson, I'll tell you why your message so stirred me tonight. And why I, I, out of all the times, I had to be here this night. And that's why I don't understand who God sent here to hear this tonight. But you know what his last words were? He didn't say, forgive me for mocking you. He didn't say one thing. He, he knows he's about to die. You know what he said? Do I still have a nose? He was worried about his nose. He couldn't breathe. Instantly died. This young man burned over 90% of his body. He said, Brother David, tell you something. they gave me morphine. They gave me every kind of drugs. And for, th for three months, I was in hell. I, I tasted. I could feel it. And God made it real to me. He said, I know there's a hell. I know there's a hell. Nobody can tell me any different. Let me tell you what I believe it's going to be like. The Bible says, first of all, it's going to be a kingdom of total darkness, both literally and spiritually. His kingdom was full of darkness. That's Lucifer's kingdom. Now, the Bible said in God's kingdom, there's no need for, there'll be no night there. There's no need of a candle, no light of the sun. For the Lord God shall give the light. Jesus Christ will shine in his glory. He's the light of those in heaven. The city says, no need of the sun, nor the moon the, to shine. For the glory of the Lord does light it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Hallelujah. Hell is eternal darkness, not a speck of light. And it'll be so tormenting, so suffocating... And this is going to be a darkness created by God. Created by God. They will gnaw their tongues for pain. Jude warned, to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. There's a darkness that cannot be defined by human reasoning. Peter said, a mist of darkness reserved forever. It's a mist that God has created that falls upon those in eternal hell. There was a darkness, remember, in Egypt. Even a darkness which could be felt, it was a thick darkness. They didn't even move. They didn't even move in their house. The darkness was so thick they couldn't see anywhere in front of them. It was a darkness that was felt. Can you imagine the darkness 
the literal darkness in hell. No one, you say, well, if there's fire, there's light. Not the liquid fire that God has created in hell. There's no light to that fire whatsoever. Jesus warned the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. More than that, it's a spiritual darkness. Outer darkness describes being cast further and further away from God. Now, folks, I don't know where hell is. Some people claim it's in the heart of the earth. The Bible said there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And I don't want my new earth to be encased in the bosom of a hell. I don't want hell in the middle of a new earth. It's impossible. No, I believe God's created, he will create a special planet. And when judgment comes and they are carried away by the angels, bound hand and foot, and cast into outer darkness, they're cast into this planet, and when God has finally finished the judgments, he will fling it into an outer cosmos, and all through eternity it will drift further and further away from the light. Jesus is the light. Hell will be a continual, everlasting, drifting into a black darkness, cast into outer darkness. That's why I say I, he's going to fling that planet into total outer darkness. And there will be a sense to everyone in hell that they're drifting further and further away from God. Now the only thing that gives any comfort to any sinner in New York or any place on this planet today is the fact that God's people are still here, the Holy Ghost is still here and working. You take the Holy Ghost out of the earth right now, it'd be a hell right here on earth. There is comfort, the Holy Ghost is a comforter. And even the sinners, wicked sinners, they don't know it, but they're feeling that sense of safety and comfort. They don't feel the sense of danger because the Holy Ghost is still here. The Holy Ghost will be torn away. There will be no spirit. There will be no life. This will be an eternal knowledge of ever drifting from the presence and the light of God. The, away from every Christian who gives joy, cheer, anything that has to do with happiness, cheer, and joy, all gone. This will be a world of transgressors, of child molesters, and of Hitlers and Mussolinis and all of the dictators. It will be a world, the Bible said, numbered with the transgressors. Numbered. Can you imagine waking up in that kind of company and looking around and there's nothing but sinners, nothing but the ungodly, and you are numbered among the transgressors. Backsliders and compromisers on earth the thought of God, of holiness and purity is going to die. Men are going to prefer darkness. Now listen to this, please. Believing a lie, reprobated, made to believe that heaven with the Lord would be worse than even hell. Now listen to me, please. You may not believe this, but everything in the Scripture proves it. I used to believe that if in hell God came with an offer to, to come, I, I forgive you, enter the gates of heaven, it would not be accepted by one person in hell. In spite of the torments, in spite of what hell is, the Bible said men prefer darkness rather than light. And men will believe a lie, and the devil will have them so deceived that they would believe. Don't believe it. It's a trick. That light that he's talking about is going to be worse than you have here, and the total deception will be that even if God offered it, it would not be accepted. Now, hell is more than just being abandoned or forsaken by God. The Bible said those in hell are going to suffer the vengeance of God. The flaming fire taking vengeance, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Now listen to this. Suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. For we know him, he said, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, saith the Lord, for it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the Lord. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. Now those that are in hell are not in the hands of the devil. They're in the hands of an angry God. And he turned, now just think for a moment. Satan himself is going to be tormented night and day. We, we, we have the idea that Satan's going to be the tormentor. He's going to be tormented himself night and day all through eternity. He's going to be occupied with his own torment. The devil was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, and he shall be tormented day and night. Revelation 20.10. But you see, this word vengeance is retaliation. God said, I'm going to repay. Now what kind of vengeance, what kind of payday for mockers and scoffers like those who, who produce these movies like The Last Temptation of Christ and the mockery of Jesus Christ? I, I, 
I, I can't even conceive in my mind the kind of vengeance that God will have prepared. If God can just speak a world and the world is destroyed by a flood, if he merely breathes his breath and fire falls on the whole population of Sodom and Gomorrah, if he just speaks a word and dust turns into lice, and he speaks a word and serpents cover the wilderness, and Egyptians are covered with boils, and all of that when God's anger was restrained. That wasn't the wrath of God. It was just a touch. Could you imagine what his wrath would be? The Bible says that those who are in hell are going to have special bodies prepared, instruments of unrighteousness. They're going to prepare bodies, instruments of unrighteousness, instruments of destruction. God, even though we get a new body, there will be a new body for those who are cast into hell, an eternal body that cannot be consumed. It has a worm that will never die and explain what that worm is at the conclusion of my message. Hell is a place of rage and hatred toward God. But here's what men are going to do. Men, when they were scorched with great heat, they blasphemed the name of God, which had power over these plagues, but they repented not to give him glory. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, and they repented not of their deeds. You go to Roosevelt Hospital up here. You go to this uh, hospital just two blocks from here. What's the name of that? St. Clair's. It's all, all AIDS now. And you go in there the AIDS ward like I have many times. And you'll see the most hatred for God you've ever seen by men and women with AIDS. They're about to die and they curse God. You will hear more cursing of those they have been plagued and they will curse God. Now I'm talking, and I'm not talking about homophiliacs. I'm not talking about those who, who, who got it uh, without in, being involved themselves into gross sin. But those who've been in gross sin and they're, they're suffering the vengeance, they have an anger toward God. Even though they're about to look God in the face, there's an anger there. Even on the streets, I've seen men dying with AIDS, banging their heads against the stone, against the curb, and cursing God. There's no, been, there's no repentance. Do you think men will repent if they won't repent with the restrained anger of God? Are they going to repent when the full anger of God comes? I asked the Holy Spirit to show me what was the greatest cause of torment in hell. And I was shocked at the, re at the answer he gave me. Why are they going to be railing and gnashing and gritting their teeth? Why this, why this terrible rage in hell? Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. The greatest torment in hell is going to be the cross of Jesus Christ. Because it's an offense. Here, now, in time, can you imagine the offense it will be in hell when the whole story is told? When they, in eternity, standing before the judgment, learn how simple the cross was, how simple grace was, and all the good deeds and charitable works and self-will created a sense of false security? The Jews will say, I kept 613 commandments. I went to synagogue, I washed my hands, I washed my pots, I washed my pans, I studied the Torah, I studied it all. And then to have this revelation that Jesus said, just look and live. It was so simple. Millions of Iranian young people, almost two million of them, that listened to the promise of the Ayatollah Khomeini, Khomeini, Khomeini who said, if you'll pray five times, if you will rush in against the Iraqis, I guarantee you paradise. They were told that they'll have all the liquor they can drink and all the beautiful women all through eternity. And those 15, 16 year olds died by the, by the hundreds of thousands. Can you imagine when they wake up in hell? When they wake up and learn the truth of the cross of Jesus Christ that was offered so simply and so freely, they will curse God. You made it too easy. It was too simple. I was tricked. And many of you that heard the God, you some of you have heard enough gospel to save China. <laughs> and we preach the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. You hear it in radio, television, every you got it coming out your ears. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when you go, when you wake up in eternal hell and remember the simplicity of the cross of Jesus Christ? That's the torment. I missed something so simple. If it had been hard, you could explain it or you could excuse it in your mind. But you can't excuse the simplicity of the cross of Jesus Christ through an eternity. And for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. 
Satan will rage forever because the cross cost him his power, put him to open shame and destroy his kingdom. They're going to rage, shake their fist against the cross of Jesus Christ. And all through eternity it was too obvious, it was too simple. How could I have known it was so simple? Now there's some other aspects about hell I want to talk about. It's a place where men's lust will burn forever and never be satisfied. Now this is hard for us to comprehend, but I want you to think about it for just a minute. The lust that now indulges the sinner is going to burn worse through hell. These bodies fitted for destruction will still be lusting away in hell. You say, well, how could there be a lust problem in hell when there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth? You explain to me how Rock Hudson, who knew he was dying with AIDS and still skin and bone, got on an airplane from Los Angeles and went to the bars in San Francisco and was still connecting just before he died, still connecting with homosexuals in gay bars about to die. He's still burning in his lust. There are men walking like skeletons out here. Walking skeletons, still trying to work a trick. I saw a woman being carried into a hospital in, in uh, Houston. She's being operated on for uh, cancer in her lungs. I think uh, one lung had been removed and they're working on another and she had a, a little hole they'd cut in her throat here so she could breathe. And they're wheeling her, her husband's following her into the operating room and I'm standing there. I think Debbie was being operated there at MD Anderson Hospital. And she turns to her husband and she says, smoke, smoke. And he likes a cigarette. She holds it to the, the hole and sucks it in through the hole. I'm standing there in total disbelief. She, she, she may not even survive the operation, but smoke. Sucking it through a hole in her neck. It's going to be hell. The lust will rage and can't be satisfied. The Bible said hell's a lake of fire. Five times the scripture calls hell a lake of fire, a fire which burneth. Unknown, like, you know, God has elements that we don't know anything about. So don't try to figure it out by human elements that exist today. This, these are elements, supernatural elements. It has no light. Elements we know nothing about. The Bible said men shall seek death there and won't be able to find it. Hell, the Bible said, will never end. It's everlasting. You can't, if you stop and think that God never was and never will be ended, you, if you stop any day and try to stretch your mind back as far as you can go and find there's no beginning of God, you can go crazy. I don't do that. God had no beginning. He has no end. It's a circle. You can't find any cut in it. But a Puritan tried to describe what eternity is going to be like. He said, suppose the whole earth, 25,000 miles in circumference, was a ball of sand. 25,000 mile ball of sand. And once every million years, a little bird came in from the cosmos and took away one grain of sand. It would take billions of years to fill a cup. And eternity would just be beginning. It would just be starting. Our minds can't conceive the everlastingness of hell. We can't even calculate it. Now, who's going there? The Bible says the majority of mankind is going to hell. The disciples said, Lord, are there few that will be saved? Jesus said, enter at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction or to hell, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads to life, and few there be that are going to find it. Now you think of New York City and 16 million people, and most of them are going to hell. Paul visited the New York City of his time, Athens. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city holy, the whole city given over to idolatry. Athens went to hell. Rome went to hell. All 
the great cities, the Sodom and Gomorrah, all the cities that have gone to hell, New York is going to hell. The majority are going to hell. I thank God that he, we're one of many lights he's raised up here in New York City, especially this bright light right on Broadway, because the Lord's, just like he's standing at the gates of hell, where men are falling into hell, he's, he's, he's established his arms stretched out by you and me, Lehar, here at Broadway, stretched out his arms and says, come, look and live, don't go this way. God's trying to push back the hordes that are rushing into hell. In Noah's day, how many were saved? Eight. Lot, his wife and two girls. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in darkness, John said. And I'll tell you what I believe. I believe the majority of nominal churchgoers are going to hell. Many, many people are going to hell who, who are so blinded, they are not living for God. They can tell you they got saved some far, sometime way back. They, they, they may have even joined a church and shaken hands with somebody. But they're not living for God. When we think of hell, we think of those going there are the obvious. The Bible said the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, murderers, warmongers, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. But the Bible said whoever is not written in the book of life, whosoever is not found in, written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The only people who are saved are those whose names are written in the book of life. There's a great white throne judgment and there's a book. The Bible said, I saw the dead small and great stand before God. The books were open. Now the book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things written in the books according to their works. Jesus made this promise. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed with white raiment. I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. I'll confess his name before my Father and all his angels. Do you know your name's written in the book of life tonight? Hallelujah. They're going, you see, in hell, and this is something the Holy Spirit showed me, and I've never heard it from anybody anywhere in the world. The Holy Spirit revealed it to me, that when Christians get to heaven, you don't suddenly get everything that heaven is. It's not static. You don't suddenly get the full revelation of Jesus. You don't say, well, I've arrived, and suddenly you get all the glory. No, heaven is an ever-increasing glory. All through eternity, it's going to get better and better, richer and richer. Jesus is going to become more and more real, more light. We're going to learn all through eternity, and we'll never get it all. All through eternity, we're still learning, still being blessed. The joy is going to be ever greater. The ecstasy is going to grow and grow and grow. You don't get it all when you get there. You just start. And you will have an ever-increasing knowledge of being saved, an ever-increasing knowledge of joy. He will wipe out all memory of those on this earth so that there'll be no suffering of your unsaved loved ones. But in hell, there's also an ever-increasing knowledge of damnation and being lost and being cast further and further away from God. And there'll be an ever-increasing knowledge of what was missed there, it's not static. You suddenly get to hell, and that's, that's it. This is the torment, and it stays at this level. No, there's an ever-increasing torment, an ever-increasing knowledge that you are lost, an ever-increasing uh, uh, sense of being cast away from the presence of God for an eternity. Well, there's going to be a surprise multitude in hell, though. The biggest multitude in hell will be in shock. Those who went to hell because of the sin of neglect... They just neglected. Just didn't take the time. They just neglected. How should we escape damnation if we neglect so great a salvation? You did not lay these things to your heart, neither did you remember the latter end. You are given to pleasures. You are living carelessly. Therefore, evil shall come upon you. You will not be able to stop it. Desolation shall come suddenly. Isaiah 47, 7 to 11. You didn't lay it to heart. You heard it and dismissed it. All of there, there are going to be a number of you walk out of here tonight, and you're going to forget everything I said except the last part. I'm going to give you in just a few moments because you'll never forget it. I'm God by Spirit going to burn it into your brain because He loves you. I'm I'm not railing at you. I'm not jumping all over the stage. I'm just standing here calmly telling you that there is a living hell, everlasting hell. Now let me tell you. 
how I see it. Now, folks, God gave me this first. I hear preachers all of America using this now. I've heard it on radio. They don't even tell where they got it from my tape. <laughs> I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you that I saw this and it shook me up and I'll never be the same. It's called instant replay. It's called the worm that never dies. And that's your conscience. The conscience. Can you imagine waking up in hell? Can you imagine the touch of eternal death on your shoulder? And the stench and the feel of a darkness that I've described to you? And then to hear the roar of the adversary, your mind, eternally. And the sense of being lost. And this sense of being ever more cast away from the presence of God. I don't think it's uh, in my limited vocabulary. I can't describe to you what it's going to be like for a person to suddenly be in hell. I am in hell. I am lost. Now, if, 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 if you could say to this person, well, 10 million years from now, you get a week's break, they may endure it. Or they said, this could last billions of years, but at the end, you'll have a little bit of hope. But there's no hope, no other chance. I am in hell. And then suddenly, the worm turns, the conscience. Because you will remember every service you've been in. You remember every scripture that was ever quoted to you. You will remember every wooing of the Holy Spirit. You will relive it and live it. You will relive my message. The message I preach right now, I preached in Puerto Rico a couple weeks ago to about 8,000 people. And I screamed over the microphone, you will hear me preach this through eternity. And a shockwave went through that stadium. And I say the same to you. You will hear it. Every message you've ever heard, every radio sermon, every witness you've had, every song that you've heard or sung, everything that had to do with Christ or his gospel, you will replay it. The conscience will turn. That's the worm that never dies that's the conscience, that's the memory. Oh yes, there's a memory in hell. You will remember it all. And suddenly, as this worm turns, I believe the worm means that a man will go between time and eternity. He drifts back and forth for quite a while before he realizes what's happened until the worm has finished his work. This worm will turn and suddenly the lights go on and suddenly there's light and he wakes up and he's back in his living room at home. And there's a Billy Graham special on television. And his little girl is playing with the doll, and he can't believe it. He pinches himself. He, he, he said, I'm, I'm alive. I can't be in hell. And his wife is in the kitchen, and he sees her, and he says, Honey, quick, come in. And she's bringing her a cup of coffee. He, he said, Honey, put the coffee down. Please, on the coffee table, i got to talk to you. I'm having some kind of incredible, I must have drunk something. Something's wrong. I have had a fit. I was in hell. I had a dream. I was in hell. I had a nightmare. Please tell me I'm alive. And she passes it. You okay? Here, drink your coffee. And he fills the warm coffee. He said, I'm alive. And Billy Graham is saying, come to Jesus. And he says, quick, on your knees. And he gets down on his knees and he's about to cry, Jesus. And he can't get the word out because just as he's about to get the words out and feel the warmth and the peace of the gospel of Jesus flood his soul, it goes dark and he wakes up. He's in hell. He said, it wasn't a dream. I'm in hell. I'm lost. And he said, don't God, never again. Don't send me back into time. A little while goes by and his lights go on again. The worm is turning. This time he's back in church. He's sitting in the same seat that he once sat. And he's reliving a gospel message. He's singing and he's sitting there stunned and he looks around he said if this is a nightmare 
if someone has put drug in my drink, God let me wake up. That man screams, God, don't let me go to hell. He's screaming, save me. The preacher's trying to preach. He's screaming at the top of his voice. And he's looking around at him. He's looking at the lights. He's counting the people. He's looking at the colors of their clothes. And he's pinching himself. He's pulling his ears. He's pulling his hair. He wants to feel. And he feels the pain. He says, how can I be dead? Or how can I be eternally dead? How can I be in hell? When I feel the pain, I hear his voice. Oh, God, I can't take it anymore. And he runs down the aisle. And he throws himself on his knees. This time, Jesus, I've got to get through. He gets the word Jesus out. And he's about to raise his hands and cry, Have mercy, but he can't get it out. Because it goes black. And he says, No, God, I'm in hell. I am in hell. He's got to go all through eternity, reliving every scene until finally it's dragged in. And he sits through it. And it's nothing but torment because he said, I wake up in a moment and there's no relief and all it is is added torment and all through eternity. Sinner, I'm going to tell you something. Backslider. You walk out on God, you're going to be back in this seat a billion, billion times. Back and forth, back and forth. And never be able to utter the word Jesus. Never be able to repent. Because the worm never dies. Never dies. Now you said, well, were you trying to scare me? You know what Peter said? Knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. If I saw you in a building down Lower East Side, and it's on fire, and you're up there, and, and you're just sitting there on a flat roof, and you're sunning yourself, and there's a fire down there, do you think I'm just going to stand there and say, I think it'd be a good idea if you got off that roof? I'd go, fire! And I'm streaming fire. You never heard hell preached in 35 minutes. I'm going to tell you what really saddens me more than anything else. I think the worst torment of all has to be those who are going to be tormented with opportunities lost and missed, just like tonight. So, Brother Dave, wouldn't the love of Jesus be better? This is the love of Jesus. He loves you so much that he would bring you to a service and change the pastor's message just to reach you. Just to reach you. Now, I'm an evangelist at heart and a pastor. But God knew you'd be here. Set you right in this seat. And you may think it's thunder and a piercing sword but it's nothing but his arms reaching out to embrace you, saying, I'm warning you in love while there's time. I'm warning you. Now, for those that are flaunting your sin in the face of God, he's warned you time and time again, don't play with sin. He's calling you to make a move tonight. Make your calling and election sure. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, help me say this last thing. I hate to say it, but I must. Some of you sitting here tonight are going to wake up in hell. Because in spite of the Holy Ghost here, in spite of the Word, you allow the enemy to come and pluck it away from you. I want you to resist the devil. Right now, resist him. He'll flee from you, the Bible said. He'll get away from you. Say, devil, get away from me. I want the word to get in my heart. I want the word into my heart. 
and let him deal with you tonight in love. Will you stand, please? Jesus, send the Holy Ghost mightily right now. Settle over this congregation, the balcony here on the main floor, and just quietly deal with us now. There's some, Lord, that have turned away from you. But I know that. There are people here tonight that have turned away. There are people, Lord, that you have just arranged to be in this meeting. You've arranged this whole night for this very moment. And now when I give an invitation, Lord, the very fact that you had me preach this must mean that you've already prepared somebody to open their hearts. Reach out, Holy Spirit, now all over this congregation. Bring in the backslider. Bring in those that are running. Bring in those that are cold of heart. Bring in those that are drifting. Bring them home, Jesus. Oh, you said flee from the wrath of God. Run from it. Flee, run as fast as you can. Run from the wrath of God. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to come in your love now. I don't want any music. If the Holy Ghost is dealing with you, folks, I don't know why, but I'll know in just a few moments. Up in the balcony in here, get out of your seat. When the Spirit of God touches you and say, Brother Dave, that message is one I had to hear. God's been dealing with me. I want you to get out of your seat. I want you to come down here right now and say, Jesus, I give it all to you tonight.